Dayton for a national championship, matching Massachusetts and Florida A&M. Now, just to give you an idea of what 1AA is, these are the schools involved in this new division of the NCAA this year. Seven teams were taken from Division 1A. 30 teams from Division 2, combining for 37 teams in 1AA. And outstanding conferences are represented in all of those schools. The Yankee, the Big Sky, Ohio Valley, the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, and the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Fleming, welcoming you once again to this national championship game. This is the fifth visit for me to the Pioneer Bowl, and I have some very vivid memories of previous games, and particularly some fine players. I remember in 1972 when Tennessee State came in here with two tall Jones and had a fantastic day. And then in 73, Louisiana Tech's Roger Carr played on this very field. And who can ever forget a year ago when Lehigh's national champions came in with Reeker and Kreider, that great pass combination, and won the title. Well, here we are again, and we welcome back an old friend, Frank Royals, who's done a marvelous job as an expert commentator on our games this year. And Frank, I know you saw your first national championship game last week in Division II. Well, Bill, anytime you mention national championship, you get any football coach's attention. And that's his dream, is to win and play for a national championship. And I've been visiting with the players, the coaches of both of these squads, and they're enthused and they're excited about the opportunity of earning their national championship in this playoff game. Bill? Maybe someday we can have it in Division I. Uh, let's hope so. Let's talk about these two teams. You know, they're very, very similar in nation, in nature, rather. One, however, from the northern part of the country, the other from the south. Both teams have explosive offenses. They try to establish the running game first. They stress the option play. They try their play-action passes off of their favorite plays, and they can move the football up and down that field. But the strength of the football team, really, Bill, is in their defense. They are truly outstanding. A&M is number one in the, in the nation in defense. And uh, Minutemen have a most unusual stat, and that is that they have a differential of giveaways or takeaways from 48 caused by their, forced by their defense to 16 that's given up by the offense. And just because, Bill, that we have outstanding defenses doesn't mean that we're going to have a low-scoring game because good defenses present scoring opportunities. And we always said to our team, fellas, if our defense plays a great ball game and gives us good field position, we're going to put some points on the scoreboard, and that's what's likely to happen today. You know, there's one fellow here who would just give anything to be out on that field today for Florida A&M. He's Ike Williams. Unfortunately, this great All-American running back was injured in the game against Grambling, had to have surgery on his ankle, and will not be out there. And boy, when a fellow accounts for more than half of your total yardage, you're going to miss it. Well, they've got a young man they're going to depend upon, their quarterback, Albert Chester, number two, who has rushed for over 500 yards. He's passed for over 1,000, so he's a gifted, very talented athlete. But more than this, he's a leader. The coaches say that he runs option plays with precision, but he has those intangibles, the intangibles that all coaches are looking for in a quarterback. So they say their game plan today is in very capable hands. Well, I'll tell you one fellow who has very capable hands himself is the quarterback of the University of Massachusetts, Mike McEvely. We saw him a week ago lead his team to victory. He was absolutely brilliant on the field. He could see openings. He capitalized on them. Truly an all-around great performance a week ago. Well, he's a great leader on the football field, too. He has control of the game. In fact, the coaches, Bill, say that he's just similar to having a coach itself right out on the field. He'll look at these players and say, hey, you missed that block last time. You make it this time. But he's a good runner, a good passer. He runs off and plays but when you put all of this together bill we're playing for the national championship the excitement here the enthusiasm and our best with these players and they're going to give an all-out total effort well we welcome back another old friend uh, on the sidelines today is a man who's done a terrific job on our post-game scoreboard show all year long dave dials dave partner bill thank you very much of course this is my third trip to the pioneer bowl and i've never managed to hit good weather here of course five times in seven years that this game has been held the weather has not been what you'd call ideal right now. It's not up to 40 degrees yet, but the wind is gusting almost to 40 miles an hour. Now, as is the case generally when things like this happen in Texas, they're blaming it on the folks in Oklahoma, just north of them, for sending that wind down here. Now, neither of these teams is in love with the forward pass, but should they try to pass today, particularly against this wind, I think it's going to look like Hoyt Wilhelm, the old knuckleballer, threw the football. Now back upstairs. All right, thank you very much, Dave. And coming out of the field now, dressed in their green jerseys, the Rattlers of Florida A&M. As you can see, losers of only one game since Tennessee State all season long. They were the voted 
national champions of 1977. Now they have an opportunity to win it out here on the field in 1978. The Rattlers facing the Minutemen of Massachusetts dressed today in their white trimmed in red coming into this game with a great victory last week to set up this final. As you can see, they have taken on five teams in Division 1A and won two of those games. A very difficult schedule, and there's the big one over at Nevada Reno, ranked number one going into the contest last week, and you had a brief glimpse there of Coach Bob Pickett, and of course, Rudy Hubbard is the coach of Florida A&M. So that sets the stage, and we'll return to Memorial Stadium in Wichita Falls, Texas, for the start of the Pioneer Bowl of 78. Here they come, first and 10. Albert Chester. Right through the middle goes Solomon. Oh, there's 10 quick ones. Joe McLaughlin bringing him down. Here's Bruce Savage, a big fella at tackle as we move across that offensive line. Autry Hayes at guard. Kaiser Lewis, six feet five at center. Tyrone McGriff, watch him today. And Betty Mills at tackle. David Green, big tight end. First and 10. Once again, they try Solomon right through there, Frank. And it worked the first time, but this time getting about four. Defensive lineman, as you see it come up there, but Motto, Gillen, Benoit, Petrie, McDonald for Massachusetts. Linebackers, McGinnis and Joe McLaughlin, the brother of center Mike, and LeMay, Sullivan, Manning, and McGuire in the backfield. Second down, about six. Ah, good move, and a fumble, a loose ball is covered by Massachusetts. Melvin McFadden lost the handle on the football. It's covered at the 43-yard line. Duncan Gillen making the recovery. Bill, we can see on the run play, it was just an aisle tackle play, and the hole opens up to the back side. McFadden has a big room to make some yards in, but he gets to take the football with him, and uh, Massachusetts recovers. A big opportunity, a scoring opportunity for him, taking possession on the 44-yard line. And up they come. First down and 10 on the 44-yard line. The Minutemen of Massachusetts. A very opportunistic team. Right through the middle goes Hank the Tank. Hank the Tank Sorrell. Getting five quick yards. Algie Hendrick. At quarterback, Mike McEvely. In the backfield with him, Dennis Dent. Little guy, 5'6", can really run. Hank Sorrell, 230 at fullback. Kevin O'Connor is the flanker. And Chris Kurtz, the split end. It's a second down. They got a little more than five, as a matter of fact. Looks more like about three. Quick pitch to Dent. Finds the hole. Gets the first down at the 32-yard line, and down he goes. And the Minutemen are in the territory of the Rattlers. Jesse Spaulding making the stop. Bill Dennis Dent has a seven-yard average for a rush for career and this year, and that's close to the averages of uh, Heisman Trophy winner Billy Sims. We're taking a look here at that offensive line, and I want to tell you, those middle three guys go 265, 258, 260. First down, the ball is on the 33-yard line. McEvely on the pitch, and it's Dent once again. Getting seven quick yards to the 25-yard line. Dorsey Hutchison, the safety man, brought him down. Defensively, Grady, Spencer, Oliver. Gates and Spaulding back there as the linebackers. Tyson, Sattler, Ramsey, and Hutchinson. Here's the situation, second down and three. And the ball is on the 25-yard line of the Rattlers. The Minutemen in possession, no score. We've just begun this national championship game. There goes the flag, as you saw. Two men jumped offside by AM. However, before we call it that way, we want to make certain that it wasn't an offensive lineman who may have moved to draw the offside. We've seen it many times this year, Frank. Bill, I believe the, the defense did jump. They're talking to the quarterback, uh, McEvely, to see what his options are. But this is a tremendous opportunity for Massachusetts right here in the opening stages of the ball game to recover the fumble, take two first downs with Dent carrying the ball outside on two big plays. First down. First down on the 20-yard line. 
kind of interesting to watch Mike McLaughlin today playing with that uh, left arm that he injured last week. It's heavily taped. Doesn't seem to be bothering him. Handoffs are flawless. McEvely on the fake. Gives it off to Sorrell. Look at Sorrell. Ramble down inside the 10-yard line as Dorsey Hutchinson stops him at the 8. Bill, when you get close to the goal line, you want to run straight ahead. Here's Surratt breaking right outside. Good blocking by the left side of the Massachusetts line of scrimmage before freshman Hutchison can bring him down. And it's first and goal to go for the Minutemen of Massachusetts. There's a Mike that I was talking about. His left arm is in a kind of a crooked position because he had a hyperextension of the elbow. Doesn't have much mobility with it. Fortunately, he only uses that right arm, that right hand for center. Down to the five goes Hank the Tank Sorrell. The senior this year from Grafton, Massachusetts, has been really one of the outstanding players for Massachusetts. Frank Brady bringing him down. Adam puts the ball down on the five-yard line. Bill Carl Nyland, the left tackle, who's made the key block on both of those runs. Weighs 265 pounds. He was all Yankee coach this year, Yankee conference this year. They say is an outstanding offensive lineman. Second down, five to go. Second and goal for the Minutemen of Massachusetts. Recovering a fumble of the Rattlers and not giving up possession. Handoff to Sorrell, but he's stacked up after getting only about a yard. So that'll bring up a third down. Sheldon Hodge making the stop, number 90. Down on the bottom, number 55, Jesse Spaulding. Bill, the, the Florida team goes right into their goal line defense inside the 10. They're trying to penetrate. They're shooting the gaps, trying to get into the backfield and disrupt the timing of the offense. All right, Chris Kurtz has now gone in for Kevin O'Connor as the split end, and he is out wide to the right, just out of frame. Watch Cliff Pedro. He's in there behind. There's Pedro, and he is stopped. He was the man who scored three touchdowns last week against Nevada Reno. Did he fumble the ball? I don't believe so, although the Rattlers are indicating that they have they may have gotten it. Hendrith and Sattler made the stop. Brings up a fourth down, so here's Vitiello. Bill, they ran four straight plays to the left side of the offense against the right side of AM. I don't know what the reason was, but it's a little bit unusual. Sandro Vitiello, a 20-yard attempt for him. Oh, he's a very versatile guy. He kicked two field goals, believe it or not, this year, right-footed when his left foot was injured. He sails this one up toward the uprights. It's good. And Massachusetts has scored first. So there's a break in the action here at Memorial Stadium, and we'll be right back after this pause. At Harold Brogan Chevrolet, we have a new name, the Chevy Farm. Now, down on our farm, you won't find any gas hogs or bum sticks. It's out in front, three to nothing. We'll kick off. I remember his uh, brother, who played for Penn State a couple of years ago. You remember that? Yes, oh, he was a good one. Alberto Vidiello. And this one sails right out of the field of play. Incidentally, there is a very strong wind coming in from the north at about 20 knots. Temperature 46. That makes the chill factor down, I, I believe, in the teens. So here we are with Florida A&M, and the one thing that Coach Rudy Hubbard said, I don't want us to make any mistakes because they'll capitalize on it, and Frank, what happens? They fumble the ball, and there are three points against them. And they're going against the wind, Bill, A&M, and so they'll try to keep the ball on the ground and punch out some first downs to get a little bit better field position. Out they come in the backfield, Chester, Douglas, McFadden, and Solomon. And off to the first man, Mike Solomon, and he is down after getting about three yards. Center of that defensive line, Benoit. McInnes, Joe McLaughlin. There's a point that uh, Frank Boyles made earlier about the fact that the University of Massachusetts has a wide edge in getting the ball from the opponent or giving it up to the opponent. Bill, that's an amazing statistic. In fact, that's what coaches dream of having. I don't think I've ever seen any that uh, pronounced. Wyman Daniels is out wide to the left. Little fella, 5'10", 155. However, they go to the right side of that line once again. And it, Seems that uh, Florida A&M likes the right side of their offensive line, and it seems that Massachusetts likes the left side. Bill, it's unbelievable the splits, the wide splits that A&M takes with their offensive line. They must be a yard and a yard and a half between every one of the offensive linemen, and Massachusetts says they're going to go in the gaps and try to cause a bad play. Sammy Knight. There's a good look at the splits. Wow. Sammy Knight, I started to mention, is out wide now and plays with Wyman Daniels. 
Chester shuttles across there, and he is rolled down by John D'Amato, number 45, defensive left end. Nice stop. Bill, that's two sensational plays by D'Amato. The first, the second, just the last play, he stopped the off-tackle play, and then he played the option play to perfection on that occasion. We have eight minutes and 53 seconds to go here in this first quarter. Fourth down and five, and the Rattlers have not been able to do much. Sammy Knight is going to have a pretty tough win to punt into. Junior from Florida A&M. Oh, kind of got a little shank off the instep, and it's going to be a short punt up to the 38-yard line. The line of scrimmage was the 25, so that's about a 13-yard punt. Well, the NFL Monday Night Football, the final game of the regular season here on ABC, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, the New England Patriots against the Miami Dolphins. Number one rushing team in the NFL, New England, against the playoff-bound Dolphins over most of these ABC stations. First and ten for the Minutemen, and they have, once again, excellent field position. Good fake by Mike McEvely, left-handed passer, got his man. Hank Sorrell, the fullback, shuttling across parallel to the line and picks up all oh, about seven yards. Bill, on the replay, it's a bootleg, and Paglione, the tight end, was wide open for a touchdown, but McEvely did not see him, but it's good execution to the second man out of the backfield, first man to fake to fullback Sorrell. Eight yards on the play. Going out now, wide to the left is Kevin O'Connor, the split end. Mike McEvely is the quarterback. He's got Hank Sorrell behind him and Dennis Dent behind him. Good power and good speed. And boy, there is one defensive play by Algie Hendrick, number 74. Algie was not a starter for the first five games of this year, but boy, he has come on and has really played some spectacular right, football. Bill, at the right of the screen on the replay, if the fans could caught, catch it early enough, number 74, Henrod just plows right in there and tackles the ball back before he can ever get started. There's a good look at him. Algie is 240, 6'2", and a junior. Well, that set him back to a third down situation and about two and a half. And here's McEvely faking the pass. Now finds a man in the middle. It is intercepted. And the A&M Rattlers get the football. Jesse Spaulding picked that ball right out of the air. Bill, one of the things quarterbacks must know is when not to throw the football. All the receivers were covered, but McAlvary tried to go way back across the green. The ball hung up in the air. Their safety man, Hutchison, it looked like right there, number 43, broke in front of it. And then Jesse Spaulding, number 55, their linebacker, made the interception. Number 18 was Warren Settler, who got his hand on the ball to deflect it. Here's a first and 10 now. Solomon breaks through, snagged momentarily, and fights his way to the 28-yard line. And here is a penalty marker down. It might have been a late hit. Bill, I think we should point out here that the, it's a big advantage to who wins the toss with this much wind because he takes the wind to his back. Opening moments of a football game, you'd like for the other team to be handling it on their 20 and not yourself. But when AM lost the toss, they had to take the ball on their 20, and that's a very dangerous position early in the ball game. A 15-yard personal foul against the Minutemen of Massachusetts. This may have been the late hit right here. Number 25, Solomon, the fullback. Bob Manning, number 21, I believe, Kyle Dole, the late hit, 15-yard penalty. First and 10 on the 43-yard line. The Rattlers are trailing three to nothing. Albert Chester slips the ball to Solomon. He only gets a yard. It'll be interesting to see here now if AM can take advantage of the turnover because the Minutemen of Massachusetts recovered a fumble at the 43-yard line, converted that into a 20-yard field goal by Vitiello. Now, on this interception, it means that AM has the ball at the 44-yard line, and with the benefit of the penalty, they're on the move. Second down and about nine. A good look at how AM has done during this entire season. Albert Chester fakes, comes inside, pitches back. Hawkins takes the ball, and he gets about four. Brings up a third down. 
Teve Tlander, number 54, is a guy to watch who was very much in evidence on the defense on that one. Fellow who's undergone uh, three bouts of surgery, two for a knee, one for a thumb, and still out there battling away. Well, a big down coming up for the Rattlers. Third down, about five. They're trailing three to nothing in the first quarter with 6.18 to go. Pioneer Bowl of Wichita Falls. Solomon. Oh, he made a good move there. He saw his hole was plugged, and he was able to change direction and get his first down at the 46. Leading scorer on the team, and uh, with Williams not in uh, or able to play, he is now the leading rusher on the squad. First Bill, down. Bill, his little, Solomon's little cut right in the end. Gave him a first down, and that was a critical play for him. They need to keep possession right here, going against the wind. Albert Chester gives the ball off, and down goes Wayman of Melvin McFadden. T. Lanner, the guy I talked about a little bit earlier, who's undergone all that surgery, was the man that made the stop on McFadden. Bill, it was an option play. They didn't block T. Lander. He just came across, read the play. When they handed it to the fullback, he closed and made the hit. Good look at what Massachusetts has done this year. As you can see, both of these squads are not only up there as far as rankings are concerned, but also as far as stats are concerned. Albert Chester shuttling across. Now he makes the pitch to McFadden. And McFadden is driven out of bounds by Joe McLaughlin. It'll be just close to the 40-yard line. Good look at him in isolation, Frank. McLaughlin is an outstanding football player, 6'2", 230. He moves right with the football on the option play and watch his feet, getting out to the boundary and making the hit on McFate. I think he really uh, was inspired with the loss of his brother last week in the early part of that game. He really played the best defensive game he's played all year long, and he's taken right up here, even though Mike is back in the lineup. Third down, about three. Going to be close as Mike Solomon tries to drill it in there at the 37-yard line. Three to nothing is the score. This is a national championship game in Division I AA of the NCAA playoffs. It's going to be a big call, a very important call. Fourth down in less than a yard, going against the wind. Will they go for it? Looks like that they are, and uh, Massachusetts is substituting some big linemen for a goal line defense. Yeah, Eric Cregan goes in at 230, and Todd Davis at 250. Fourth down, a yard for the Rattlers of AM. No gain and a loss of two. Knifing through is Steve T. Lander, and McFadden, or rather it is Solomon Stop. Bill, I think on the replay, you'll see a little bit of an unusual play to run on short yards. Let's see if they block the defensive end, T. Lander. No, they do not. He is unblocked, comes clear in the backfield, and makes the play on Solomon for a loss of their critical play against the A&M Rattlers. So it's first and ten for the Minutemen of Massachusetts, leading in the ball game three to nothing. And Florida A&M was not able to convert that turnover into a score. Here is the double reverse and a pitch back to McEvely. He's got a man wide open. It's Chris Kurtz, and he can't get to it. It was partially deflected by number 29, Darrell Tyson. Bill, we have a little dipsy doodle here early. One of the fine plays in football today is the lateral to the tailback, hand back to the wing back, lateral back to the quarterback. All the time, the wide receiver is going downfield, but the wind is so pronounced, the ball got up and started sailing, and Kurtz could not get his hands on the football. Second down and 10. And that brought the fans here in Wichita Falls to their feet. Inside handoff goes to the big man coming around. That is Mike Newell. Jesse Spaulding's a good fellow to keep your eye on today. Bill, he gets a good read on a misdirection reverse play and then just forces and plugs the hole. A good linebacker wants to move forward and make the play just as Spaulding did on that instance. So we have a third down and seven situation. And the win behind the backs of the Minutemen for the next three minutes and 45 seconds, then things will change. So McEvely looks to throw and is run out of bounds and crashes into the bench. He hit that bench with his head, and he is down. 
He crashed into the bench and actually, I think, splintered it. Well, this Pioneer Bowl, Massachusetts against Florida A&M, is being brought to you as an exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. Let's pause five seconds to allow our local stations to identify themselves. 27, come and come in. apparently is all right. Here is Tim Fontaine, back to do the punting. Gets a good sailor down with the wind, and it'll be angling toward the sidelines at excellent Kick goes out of bounds with the five. AM will take over the football at their own five. We'll return to Memorial Stadium in Wichita Falls, Texas for more of the Pioneer Bowl right after this. If you're playing Santa this year, let Whataburger be your helper. At Whataburger, we make gift certificates. And it definitely has an effect on this football game. First and ten for Florida AM at their own five. Handoff goes to Solomon, blasts through the tackle spot, and gets the ball out to about the 13-yard line. Steve Tlander, number 54, bringing him down. Bill, that's an ideal play for first down when you're coming off of your goal line like a and is. You want, to, you, want to, you, you want to make enough yards to where you can still keep the football on the ground. Eight yards is perfect. Coach Bob Pickett, in his first year as the head coach, for seven years was the defensive coordinator, and Rudy Hubbard is in his fourth year at Florida A&M. Timeout here is called by Florida A&M. They look at the clock. They've got 2.56 to go. Of course, they'd like very much to keep possession of this ball, so when they switch around, they'll have that wind to their back, Frank. Bill, the, the wind, this much wind, really changes your strategy. You really, we used to tell our team we're going to have two halves to play, one with the wind and then one against the wind, and they're going to be entirely different football games. Our strategy is going to be different. Everything that we do will have a different outlook, a different pace of it than when we have the wind to our back, and that's what's happened so far in this first quarter. An example, A&M going against the wind started with the ball on their 20, their 20, their 22, and on their five. That's very poor field position, but that's what happens when you uh, go against the wind such as this. Well, coming up tomorrow over most of these ABC stations, the bowl game preview. Sugar and fun, and who's number one? Highlighting the Sugar Bowl matchup, number one, Penn State, and number two against Alabama. Interviews with coaches Joe Paterno and Bear Bryant. Plus, a look at some other interesting matchups, the Liberty Bowl, the Gator, the Rose, the Orange, and the Cotton. So be with us, won't you, over most of these ABC stations. Here's the pitch to McFadden. McFadden gets to the 19, and he is tripled right there. McLaughlin, LeMay, and one other man, Kevin McGuire. Watch McLaughlin, number 51, get a read on the play, get knocked down, but a good linebacker, Bill, does not stay down. He gets up and eagerly chases the ball carrier and gets involved right there. Perfect play as LeMay made the play, but McLaughlin helped on it. First down. <laughs> And Solomon gets a couple more. You know, you talk about those splits in that line, Frank. You might explain what the split does for you. Bill, that's unbelievable splits for any football coach, but A&M has always had success doing this. They have quickness in the line of scrimmage, and what every team must do is move into those gaps and try to penetrate. Otherwise, they move you outside or get blocking angles where they can circle you as they did on that pass play. Second down and six. The ball is on the 23-yard line, and the Florida A&M Rattlers are trailing in this game three to nothing. First quarter. There's the pitch to McFadden. Turns the corner, and boy, he doesn't get any farther than that. Steve LeMay was there with that old hit, lift, and drive kind of tackle. LeMay is an outstanding football player. He was all Yankee Conference last year. He is a good tackle, as we saw on this. He's big and strong. He's 6'2", 190. That means any halfback has the ability like the size and speed he does to come up and take on the ball carry and knock him back. Brings up a third down situation. Third and six on the 23 yard line. And in case you joined us a little bit late just coming in from Christmas shopping we'll remind you that this is the final game in Division 1 AA of the NCAA playoffs this year. Florida A&M against Massachusetts. Here comes McFadden. Gets to the 25 and just gets his nose on the 30. It's enough I believe for the first down. McGuire and Manning double teaming in there. Numbers 21 and 24. Bill, when you have an option play, the lead block has to make the key block on force. 
and that was Hawkins, number 21, led to the outside when the cornerback came up to make the play. Sullivan, he blocked him on the ground and sprung him into the backfield, and hopefully for A&M, they made a first down. Look from here as if he actually did make it. But uh, they want to be sure. Yeah, he made it by about half the length of the football. Well, Bill, that gives them a chance to, to run the clock out at least and get the win. Here's the replay, an option play. Quick pitch because the defensive end crashed. And you see McFadden picking up the block of number 21 on uh, LeMay, I guess it was, and he makes the first down. Big play for the egg, for uh, the Rattlers. First and 10, just short of the 30-yard line. A minute to go in the first quarter. Here's Albert Chester being chased across, and he's going to take it out of bounds at the 33-yard uh, line. John D'Amato giving chase there, number 45. And 55 ticks on the clock mean that uh, if AM can hang on to the ball, they'll be turning around. There's Mike McEvely, who uh, ran into the bench head first moments ago and doesn't seem to be suffering any ill effects from it. Last week, he was very impressive, 7 out of 13 and a touchdown, and uh, just generally ran that uh, team in flawless fashion. Second down, about six. Florida A&M in the green, Massachusetts in the white, trimmed in red. For the national title in Division I AA, Solomon doesn't get much, just to the 36. He is snagged by Kevin McGuire, number 24. Bob Pickett, coach of Massachusetts, calls for the timeout here. And so we'll return to Memorial Stadium in Wichita Falls, Texas, for more of the Pioneer Bowl right after this. Uh, here the uh, viewers can see a picture of uh, Bob Pickett, the coach in his first year at Massachusetts, playing for the national championship. And it all coaches agree that when you have this much success in your first year, we always say, Bill, how sweet it is. Third down coming out for Florida A&M. 47 seconds to go in the first quarter. And Florida A&M is trading three to nothing. Here's a deep handoff going to Bobby Hawkins. And, oh, he is hit hard by Joe McLaughlin. Talk about intensity. Bill, this was a reverse play where they faked up the middle and handed back to the wing back Hawkins. But McLaughlin was not fooled. Watch him right here. Wow. You put the helmet on him, his isolation, you see him take the fakes to the left, that's when the backs went in that direction. Now watch the recovery and the lateral movement, sees the play and plugs the hole and makes an outstanding F play. I'll tell you, it was a very important play in terms of Massachusetts because it stops the drive three yards short of the first down and it forces not only a and to go for that punt into the win, but it probably is going to give Massachusetts maybe a play or two with the win. And that wind is strong, as you can it, see. It's strong, Bill. And A&M has been in their goal line offense this entire quarter. They've been in their power eye, everybody in tight, trying to make a first down. Sammy Knight, number three, back there. He'll be letting it go from about the 24, 25-yard line. No snap. Makes a nice pickup. But look at that floater. It goes up and comes back and is down to the 48-yard line. Actually, that ball went over the 50 and then blew back a 12-yard punt. That, together with his 13-yard punt earlier. Don't blame him because kicking into this win in Texas, I know the wind has blown here sometimes. Bill, I've seen some of our players have kicked the ball, and they'll come right back to you. Watch the ball get up in the air. It's not funny to the A&M football team, but it's going to come right back, as you mentioned, bounce right back and they have to down it immediately or we've been back to the line of scrimmage. Hank Sorrell bangs in there for about six. 24 seconds to go in the first quarter. The Minutemen of Massachusetts playing for the national championship against Florida A&M and the Minutemen have a three to nothing lead. Just about time maybe to get this playoff. They hurry. I don't think they're going to make it. Horn blew. And that is the end of the first quarter. So there is a timeout here at the Pioneer Bowl. And the score at the quarter, Massachusetts 3, Florida AM nothing. And we'll be right back after this. Going against the win, that was most important and kept them from getting scored on a couple of times. Massachusetts in possession, second down and five. The ball is on the 44-yard line. Somebody broke, 
And flags everywhere. And hang on to them, fellas, because they're going to blow away. Carl Nyholm, offensive tackle, moved, and so that'll cost him five. Bill, we'll watch him jumping offside on the right side of the line. Watch Nyland, number 75, jump offside, miss the snap count in some way. Big mistake right here going against the wind. Cost them valuable yardage. Second and 11, the ball is back to the 49. Massachusetts, however, is in the lead as Dent can't find any hole. Algie Hendrick making the stop. The strategy in this case for Texas A&M feeling like that, excuse me, for that Florida A&M is to go up into a goal line defense, feeling that the quarterback, McEverly, cannot throw against this win, so they're penetrating with eight and nine man lines trying to give bad plays and get the ball so they can have good a field position. Third down and 11. Massachusetts in the lead, three to nothing, second period. McEverly on a pivot, goes to the 44 yard line, down there. Spun to the ground by number 91, Joe Yates. Fourth down now, and Massachusetts will have to punt into this win. Tim Fontaine, I'll tell you one thing he showed us last week. He's a versatile punter. He can kick that ball low, and he can kick it hard, and he can kick it accurately. kind of floats on a spiral but it's a good kick because it angles over to the left and will not allow a return at the 15 yard line so we have 13 minutes 46 seconds to go in the first half and after that 28 yard punt it'll be Florida A&M's Rattlers now here's what all of their fans have been waiting for a chance for them to go with the win they have an explosive offense with Chester and Solomon Bobby Hawkins and McFadden in the backfield right now Wyman Daniels is a dangerous split end. David Green, a good pass catching tight end. Let's see what they do with it. First and 10. Chester gives it on the delay and down goes the ball carrier. Melvin McFadden. I'll tell you one thing, there's a certain finality about being hit by one of those Massachusetts linemen. Number 33, Melvin McFadden, the ball carrier. Steve McMenus, McInnes, number 41, was a strong safety last year, and Jim Reed, the line coach, moved him into linebacker, and he's had a sensational year playing linebacker for the first time. All right. With the second down, Albert Chester goes back to pass. Throws a long floater. He's got Daniels there, and he can't hang on to it. Bob Manning making the stop. Bill, on the replay from the end zone, the fans should watch that uh, Massachusetts is in a roll defense to the point that uh, A&M is not going to have anybody open because they've got a three-on-two situation. They're letting their cornerback and safety man play up on the short pass passes and manning their safety man coming over the top, nearly intercepted it. Third down and seven for Florida A&M and another one of those key third down situations. Rudy Hubbard, former star at Ohio State University, the coach. Albert Chester getting a little bit of pressure now, has to eat it. Steve T. Lander, number 54, moved in to stop him. It'll bring up fourth down. T. Lander has made three sensational plays already in this football game. That's Ray right. Benoit, number 89. Watch Chester drop the pass, drop the pass. Sometimes it, when you have the win, you want to go for the bomb early, and that's what they're doing here, going for the fly pattern. The receiver was covered, and T. Lander got in and made the play for a big loss. Hey, you know, did you see Benoit on that? He really got taken out of the play, and he got he popped right back up and helped out on the tackle. I had missed that on the earlier one. All right, here's Sam Knight in his own end zone. Line surges. They block it. Loose ball. Recovered at the one-yard line by Massachusetts. Oh, what a surge that defensive line put on. Bill, let's see who does block it. You can see the three or four of them were back in there of the Massachusetts football team. Here's another look at it from the side. Kicker fumbles the ball just a little bit. Wow, what an effort. Was that number 35? No, it was 35, Scott Crowell. Number 35, Scott Crowell, 
in on that uh, specialty team and boy he certainly got himself a great hunk of the football and now with a first and goal to go on the one foot line is Massachusetts hand off to Surratt he gets his nose close but not over I don't believe although the players of Massachusetts say yes there is no official signal well, Tim Shavers, 242 pounder, stopped him. On the replay, you see it's just a face straight ahead off tackle play. You watch the power in the legs of Sorrell. He weighs 230 pounds. He's pumping action. Usually will put you in the end zone, but the Rattlers stopped him just short. It'll be second and goal to go. Just inches to go for a touchdown. Mike McEvely, the quarterback, he's going to sneak it through, but he is pushed back. He is pushed back by Willie Spencer, number 71, a 255-pound defensive tackle. Oh, is it close. That ball is only four inches from that chalk strike. Offensive guard Tyrone McGriff is a great athlete, and he's in on this goal line defense, and he got tremendous penetration on the quarterback sneak over the right offensive guard, Kimball. Well, there's a great shot of how far it is to go, and they're painful, painful inches. Broken play, fumble. Loose ball. Covered, I believe, by AM, although there was a Massachusetts man there. <laughs> what a wild, wild four inches. Give credit to the AM defense. With inches to go, they have stopped them cold and forced them to try a bootleg pass. The blitz was on from the quarterback. Let's see what happens on the right side of your screen. It's a bootleg. It's a broken play. Tries to roll out, but we see someone coming from the right side and knocks him loose from the ball. Number 74, Algie Hendrick. I believe Hendrick, that's right. It was covered by Massachusetts, so it brings up the fourth down, and Vitiello will try a 20-yard field goal. He's already made one. This one sails up, curves, and it's good. Well, give credit to the AM defense. They stopped a sure touchdown. And so Massachusetts had to settle for the field goal. We'll be right back after this. The University of Massachusetts will now kick off with Vitiello kicking, and we have three men deep, Sammy Knight. This is a kind of a squib kick picked up by McGriff. Hey, he might be a runner. Tyrone McGriff. Wow. Ooh, 260. <laughs> I believe I'd put him at fullback somewhere. He is an All-American guard. He has been all SIAC three years, including his freshman year. Number 68, Tyron McGriff, 250 pounds of offensive guard, playing fullback on that kickoff. There was an offside on the kickoff on the part of Massachusetts, and the question will be now, will Florida A&M accept and ask them to uh, kick it off again? It, I have a feeling they're going to decline it. It's too good field position. Uh, Dave, uh, you have something for us, Dave Dials? Bill, the wind is so terrible here that uh, Coach Bob Pickett wasn't too disappointed that his team didn't even get it in. He's exhorting his defensive players just to play possession ball and just to play control ball, and you could see the tremendous influence the wind has. Vitiello really put the foot to that little field goal there and just barely got it up and over the crossbars. Well, we're getting a good shot of that American flag in the north end zone as that chilly wind blows down. Uh, really nothing to stop it, I guess, between here and the Canadian border. <laughs> All right, they're going to uh, kick over. I thought there was a penalty. Put it on the 40-yard line. Where's the penalty? Well, uh, don't quite understand that, but McGriff gets it again. And he goes to the 45-yard line. <laughs> Do you think he isn't having fun in this playoff game? Oh, that's that's a tremendous effort. Here it is, Vitelio Vitelio kicking on the ground rather than get the ball up in there. Watch McGriff take it right there, make a couple of side steps, but he's not going down, Bill. Watch him pivot, turn, just like a good runner. Incidentally, on that uh, controversial uh, play, both sides were offside on the kickoff. That's the reason there was no penalty. Here's Albert Chester, and he throws the bomb. Got a man. Can't hold on to it. 
Kenny Boggins, senior split end, was in the open. Bob Manning would not have had a chance to break it up, but he couldn't hang on to it. On the replay, you'll see Chester roll to the right. He's trying to get one man deep and one in the flat. First choice really was the short man, but when he gets outside, the defensive backs react up just momentarily, and their receiver wide open in behind him, but he couldn't hold on to it. I think he would have been out of bounds anyway. Frank uh, looked like his, his right foot was right on the line, so it would not have been a completed pass had he caught it. Here's McFadden slashing back, bucking heads, knocks the man down and keeps on his feet. He may go. He's to the 10. He is out. Is he out of bounds? Yes, on the three-yard line. Melvin McFadden banged heads, and then after knocking Manning down, number 21, he was forced out of bounds by Kevin McGuire, number 24, 53 yards. Let's watch the replay. Watch McFadden be his own blocker. By being your own blocker, you put your head down and you run over the safety man. He knocked Manning, Bob Manning, the safety man number 21 down and goes to the four three yard line. What a play. And suddenly the Rattlers have come to life. 9.42 to go in the first half. They're trailing six to nothing, but they have a first and goal. Here's Solomon getting it to the two. Joe McLaughlin knifing in to stop him. Hey, I'll tell you, this has the makings of a great ball game, Frank. McLaughlin is an outstanding linebacker. Let's watch number 51. He gets a read on the play, like as a good linebacker should. He just ignores the blocker coming through on him, number 21, Hawkins, and he moves over and makes the play and prevents a touchdown. And it's just short of the two-yard line. Second down for the Rattlers. Trailing six to nothing, nine minutes and nine seconds to go in the first half. Handoff goes to Solomon, and, and McLaughlin is there again to stop him. Let's look at it from the ground level and see what happens right in the pitch, right in the middle of that line. Right here, the blocking of the right side of the line, David Green, number 87, handoff to Solomon, the fullback. He tries to grab, and then McLaughlin, number 51, comes in along with Bob Manning, number 21. Maybe they need Tyrone McGriff in there, 261 <laughs> pounds to run it in. Yard to go, third down. Chester takes it for the TD. Albert Chester takes it in. That is an all tied now, six to six between Florida and m and the University of Massachusetts. On the replay, you'll see that the option play is really the best play to run on the goal line when the defense have moved inside and are penetrating. They wall off the, the pursuit, and the quarterback is able to get outside after faking the Solomon. You see that the wide opening gap he has to turn inside and score. Good play, good call. Here's Vince Coleman to try, and there's a flag down, as you can see. Bill, I would like to make mention right here that uh, Massachusetts has got their backs to the wall now where they're going to get the kickoff deep on their end of the field the first time in the ball game that they've had poor field position. Procedure, and it is against Massachusetts. It's an all-tied ball game at 6-6. Six and six. That 53-yard run by Melvin McFadden where he bowled over the safety man and almost carried it in set up the score. Here's Coleman's try, a conventional kick. It's off to the left, but there's a marker down. Bill a is off sides again. So if it's unsuccessful, they'll try it again, and they may go for two. You can't tell. They will now, let's see, a half of three yards is one and a half, and half of yard and a half is three quarters of a yard. You can see number 89, I guess it is, and number 41, uh, Steve McInnes jumping off sides. Kick is off to the left, sails to the left, unsuccessful but another tip for a and m distance is not the problem with that 20 mile an hour wind behind him but accuracy is of course up this one goes and that one looks good and no flags are down and so florida a and m has taken the lead by the score of seven to six we'll return to memorial stadium in wichita falls texas for more of this pioneer bowl right after this well it didn't take florida a and m long to score a minute and 41 seconds, and of course, 53 of those 55 yards were put up by a great run by Melvin McFadden. Now here is Vincent Coleman getting ready to kick off. Kevin O'Connor is deep for Massachusetts. Ooh, and he sails it deep. This may go down to San Antonio. <laughs> Psychologically, the win is a big factor. 
coaches that just hate to play in the in the wind. They'd rather play in the rain, I believe, than a big, a strong wind like this. Bob Pickett, the head coach of the University of Massachusetts, talking to his quarterback, Mike McEvely, and Rudy Hubbard on the far side of the field, very pleased with his comeback team. You know, in the season, this team, Florida A&M, fell behind 17 to nothing to Bethune-Cookman and won the ball game 27 to 17. Frank and I were privileged to see films of that game yesterday in the presence of the coaches, and it was quite a performance. They have great pride and tradition. They know what the winning is like. A couple of yards, and that's it. Incidentally, the Florida A&M Band, one of the most celebrated musical organizations in the entire area of college football, is here today and will be on at halftime. Dave Diles has a very spicy halftime for you, I guarantee you. <laughs> and I'm referring, not uh, with a pun intended, to the Chili Pow Wow and the results of it, the annual event held uh, in connection with this Pioneer Bowl. So we'll be looking forward to Dave's halftime today. Now the handoff goes to Newell. Doesn't get anybody fooled as Algie Hendreth, number 74, comes into steamroller him. What happens on that play, I think our fans should could understand is that Hendrick is slanting to the inside. The tackle is pulling. There's no one to block him. He goes right in the backfield, follows the ball carrier, and tackles him for a loss. We have seven minutes and a half to go in the first half, and it's a seven to six ball game as Florida A&M University is leading Massachusetts by one. McEvely tossing deep to Dent. Tries to scoot outside, but good defense there. Just kind of floated with him. Didn't want to uh, make a commitment as John King, number 77, and Algie Hendrith, number 74, just cushioned their blockers with their hands, and we have a man down on the field. I believe it's uh, Hendrith, number 74. Yeah, Algie was hurt on the play. Dave Dows, do you have something for us? I just talked uh, a moment ago with the coach of the Massachusetts Minutemen, Bob Pickett. He told me, he said, we're not worried about the weather. We both have to play in the same weather. The wind is, has the same effect on both teams. He said, what really concerns me is the mistakes that our team is making. Now back upstairs. I like your hat. <laughs> Algie Hendricks, all right. He had the wind knocked out of him. I'm sure Coach Pickett was talking about getting the ball on the one-foot line, a one-yard line, Bill, from a block kick and could not put it in. Well, it may haunt him in this ball game for the national championship. Now Tim Fontaine's going to be tested. He's going to be kicking into a big win. After A&M had a 12 and a 13-yard punt in the first quarter, Fontaine gets the low snap, picks up the ground ball, and kicks it. Gets it just to about the 45-yard line, maybe a little more, and now it's going to roll to 49. So with a timeout here at the Pioneer Bowl, the score is Florida A&M 6, Massachusetts 7 to 6 over Massachusetts. We'll be back after this. Give up. Early in the game, Kevin, you've had the ice pack on there quite a while. What's the problem? Uh, right above the Achilles heel, I got kicked there, and uh, I can walk on it, but I try to run full speed, and I just can't do anything. It's just hurting the team from out there. Back upstairs to Bill. All right, that means that Tony Jesse, number 22, a sophomore, will take Kevin Sullivan's place. First down for Florida A&M. Hand off to McFadden. Tough runner. Steve LeMay was the stopper and uh, might make mention of the fact that Ike Williams, the All-America running back of Florida A&M, has been adequately replaced, I would guess, with McFadden, whose 53-yard run set up the touchdown. He's a good one, Bill. The momentum has shifted over to the A&M football team for this quarter with the wind to their back. Second down and nine, and there goes Solomon. Look out for him. He's got a first down at the 30. Kevin McGuire making the stop on him. 19 yards on the play. On the uh, wide splits of the offensive line, if the defense don't split with you, you have blocking angles, and you see the hole opening up as they cave the inside of the defense of Massachusetts inside and opened up a hole that Solomon made a big, big first down. First down and 10. Here's Chester. He has some running room, goes to the 25, and goes out of bounds, and he may be very close to another first down. It's always nice, coaches feel, to have a quarterback who can run with a football when he gets outside and his receivers 
are covered because the defense has dropped back and that's what happened on that occasion and Chester just took the decision and moved forward and made close to 10 yards. You know, Frank, uh, during our commercial break, you said, boy, has the momentum changed. You are so right. It's obvious. You can see the way the teams come out of the huddle when they've got the momentum, just as A&M's doing right now. They're sprinting up and getting ready. Second and one, the ball just short of the 20. Chester has the first down. Seven to six is the score, and in case you join us a little bit late this afternoon, Florida A&M University in the green is playing for the national championship in Division I AA against the University of Massachusetts Minutemen. The score is seven to six. Massachusetts had two field goals to go up six to nothing, but then Florida A&M igni ignited on a 53-yard run by McFadden, put it in to go ahead after the conversion. As you can see, five and a half minutes to go in the first half. And with a first and 10 on the 19-yard line, the Rattlers give the ball to McFadden. He's got about three, and then he is buckled at the 14-yard line, but falls forward for five. Duncan Gillen, number 88, making the stop. Rudy Hubbard on the sideline, talking with one of his players to send in. They do shuttle back and forth all of their offensive plays. The eye formation gives a tailback like McFadden, who has quickness and nifty runner, running opportunities, and creates holes, and he finds a little soft spot and darts right in it. And with a second down and three. AM threatening once again. Hand off to Solomon, wedges his way through a little opening and has a first down inside the five. What blocking. If we let's look at it from the end zone, I think our fans will notice the wide splits that are giving blocking angles, and you can see. McLaughlin get blocked to the left side of the right side of your screen and Solomon breaks right in the secondary. The splits give you either blocking angles or they widen you and you can run right up the middle through wide openings. What do you do defensively to stop it, Frank? You move into the gaps and penetrate. All right, with the first and goal to go on the four. Chester keeps, shuttles along, fakes, he's going to score. Florida A&M has gone in front by the score of 13 to 6 and the fans erupt on the far side of the field. Albert Chester, senior quarterback, most valuable player for the last two years, has put him in front. A uh, good seven points now. When you get close to the goal line, the option play, you can see the reverse turn, fake to the fullback, that seals off all inside pursuit. Look at the gaping hole that Chester has, but he runs right through the arms of number 44, LeMay. And the kick is good by Vincent Coleman. And we'll return to Memorial Stadium in Wichita Falls, Texas, for more of this Pioneer Bowl right after this. Across the plains of Oklahoma and Texas. It definitely has an effect on this ballgame, Frank Ross. Well, coaches hate to play in the wind. We'd rather play in a driving rain because it changes your entire strategy. You use a goal line offense going against it and a wide open offense when you're going with it. You change your defense. It's just two different ball games entirely. Won't be any return here, I don't believe. So at the end of the first quarter, it was three to nothing in favor of Massachusetts. And now in this second period, Massachusetts has scored three, but Florida A&M has scored 14. Well, I think when Massachusetts flipped up, they had great field position. They started with the ball on A&M's 43, 37, 48, one in the first quarter and got three points. That's where they messed up. And quite a large difference, however, in the rushing as Florida A&M has 181 yards. Here's a first and 10 situation. Mike McEvely, the quarterback of Massachusetts. His team is now trailing by eight points. Sorot only gets a couple, keeps on driving, and gets uh, maybe two more as Henrith is the man on top. Willie Spencer will probably be the man underneath number 71. It is absolutely critical for Massachusetts to make a first down and not have to kick again into this win and give a&M field position again. With a second and six, critical it is. Mike McEvely, the quarterback, hands off to the trailing man, and it's Dent, and he gets a hard knock, but it knocked him forward, actually, to a first down. 
Harold Oliver, number 67, number is in the lineup. Watch Oliver, number 67, slant. He's running around the center, what we call slanting, shooting the gap in the backfield. And, of course, Dent runs right behind him in the area he just vacated. But Oliver turns right back in and makes the part of in the tackle. First and ten. Big first down for the Minutemen. Hand off to Sorrell. He has ten quick ones and keeps on going across midfield into 47-yard territory of Florida A&M. Hank Sorrell, a 230-pound fire plug out of Grafton, Massachusetts. Well, you, Bill, you're talking about a power runner. Watch it right here. This is what coaches like to see when they're going against the wind. Beautiful blocking, but watch him run right over the safety man, Hutchison, and keep on going. 230 pounds. Big gain for Massachusetts. 22 yards on the play. First and 10. Dent is leveled by Jesse Spaulding, number 55, before Dent ever got up ahead of steam. Dent isn't very big. He's only 5'6", 155 pounds. Kind of a mismatch there with a 221-pounder. But he has that quickness that uh, gives him the breakaway opportunities. He's averaged over seven yards rushing for a career at Massachusetts. Second and 10. 2.40 to go. First half. Massachusetts trails by eight. Dead again. This time he weaves for about three. Algie Hendrith, number 74, cutting across to make the stop. 43 is Hutchison there. Boy, it's been a tough day on safety, men. Manning was bowled over. Hutchinson was bowled over by a rampant runner. We always say you've got to be your own blocker when you get that far downfield. And the big plays, you don't plan them like that, Bill. They happen. You start with a play like the off-tackle play that's a route run. You make three yards, it opens up, and you make 22. Third down and five. 2.07 to go in the first half. Massachusetts going against a big wind here and trailing. Here comes Oliver. Pass hurried and misthrown. Intended for Kevin O'Connor. Brings up a fourth down. Oliver putting the heat on, coming in from the left side. So it brings up a fourth down situation with 1.59 to go, and Tim Fontaine has come in. McEvely on the sidelines now for Massachusetts. Number 10, Tim Fontaine. Fontaine will try to angle it over. They're playing a short safety man now, maybe uh, thinking that there will not be a kick, but Fontaine goes through with it, floats it off to the left side, and the ball is going to be knocked out of bounds at the 24. Not much of a punt, 16 yards, Frank. Well, we can see the effect of the wind kicking right into the teeth of it. Watch the ball go up and come just down and right back towards the kicking team, Massachusetts. And they finally down it on the, what, the 23 or 4 yard line. I don't know about you, Frank, but I hate to play golf in the wind. <laughs> I'm the worst Doesn't of the bother world. you. First and ten. Ball on the 24. Handoff goes to McFadden. Number 33, Melvin McFadden. Ball carried. Florida A&M uh, had those two punts in that first quarter. Knocked their average way down. For eight yards. I don't think that I have seen that in a long, long time. But in Texas, this wind does blow, and you have to be ready for it. One minute and 28 seconds to go. Clock running. First half, Bob Pickett, the coach of Massachusetts, exhorting that defense to stop him here. They definitely do not want to allow any other score. Trailing by eight, and there goes Chester down. He's grounded at the 18-yard line. This is, incidentally, the final game for this artificial turf here at the Pioneer Bowl. They're going to take it up and put down a new one. It sees a lot of action, and there are some places that are a little bit threadbare. They have three or four high schools that play on it every week, plus junior highs and uh, B teams, and et cetera. And so there is a lot of football, but it has served its purpose. Nine good years. Well, I'll tell you this. It's, it's certainly unusual to come here and see a field that high schools use and have artificial turf. It uh, has to be one of the few in the country. Stop and go, and it's Bobby Hawkins. Bobby breaks to the sidelines, and they're going to try to pin him in there. A desperation move on the 33-yard line by Kevin McGuire, forcing him out of bounds. Bill, that is as fine an individual effort as you'll ever want to see. 49 yards, the blocking was not there. 
It was a, re a reverse play. Watch Hawkins make this on his own. He bobbled the handoff. The blocking was not there, but watch his moves. Once he gets in the secondary, he makes Manning miss him, and then Jesse misses him, number 22. Big play. And here is Chester firing, but this is going to float right over the head of the intended receiver, number four, Kenny Boggins. That's for number four. Stops the clock, however, with 24 seconds to go, and that's what's important. At this stage, 14 to 6, Florida A&M University, referred to many times as FAMU. That's what they are on the uh, scoreboard here. Out in front of Massachusetts by eight. And now with 24 seconds to go, trying to get up for another one. They trail at one point, six to nothing. Second and 10. Chester over the middle, balls batted down, incomplete. Only used three seconds on the clock. Joe McLaughlin was the one who tipped it. Incidentally, we're gonna be naming the offensive and defensive players of the game. And Chevrolet will be awarding $1,000 to their respective institutions in those players' names to go to the General Scholarship Fund. Money that uh, I'm, I know will be appreciated by whatever school gets it. Rudy Hubbard on the sidelines, masterminding his team. They're leading 14 to six. Here's the pitch back, goes to the end around Sammy Knight. He's got some room down on the other side, but there's a marker down and I believe a clip. Number 79 came across Bruce Savage and it looked like he clipped Joe McLaughlin at about the 40 yard line. See what you think. Reverses at this stage of the game can be effective because the team are playing loose and dropping off. This is a pitch back reverse to Knight the flanker coming back around, but you see Savage, his Savage clipping on the clockman, number 51, negating the play, even though Knight makes a sensational run deep down and probably in within field goal range, if not possibly a touchdown. Well, that's the point to make with nine seconds, Frank. The field goal range now has been removed. And the uh, ball goes back to the 43 and a half, 44 yard line. So with nine seconds to go, Florida A&M is out in front 14 to six, but it doesn't look like they're gonna get a chance to get any more. Bill, let's look and see if we can see the clip right here, number 51, and uh, Savage, number 79, the tackle who's rolling back, gets him a little bit from the back. Funny thing about that, he didn't really need to make the block. I don't believe that uh, McLaughlin could have made the play. Looked to me like, as you said, Bill, Knight had outrun him and had circled in and was headed down the boundary. What do you do on a situation like this? About the only thing that you can do, I would guess, is throw the ball as far as you can. And uh, if you don't complete it, hope it is interference. And then line up and kick a field goal. And I've seen it happen before. Well, Albert Chester, the senior quarterback from Jacksonville, Florida, being talked to by Rudy Hubbard. Rudy Hubbard, uh, I guess you'd have to say, is a disciple of Woody Hayes. He played for him, coached for him, and uh, really doesn't like to pass all that much. Uh, he, he had learned well from Woody Hayes to run and establish a running game. Kenny Boggins on the right side and with nine seconds to go keep your eye on him because Chester looks for him down the sidelines incomplete the pass was not intended for him but for Bobby Hawkins his wing back so it stops the clock and we have time maybe for one more play Florida A&M's band is here today we have a wonderful halftime for you so be sure to join Dave Dials this Pioneer Bowl uh, every year has grown. They have a, a wonderful parade, a Christmas parade motif on Friday afternoon down the streets of Wichita Falls. And these young men who participate just have really thoroughly enjoyed themselves. They're all going home with cowboy hats and boots. Albert Chester, final play of the first half, pitches it off to McFadden. McFadden stumbles and is thrown out of bounds, and that will end the first half and of play. So now let's go down to Dave Dials, uh, who has Bob Pickett with it. Bob, I know you're disappointed. You expected better things at, at halftime. You certainly did. We're making more mistakes this half than we've made all year long, uh, Dave, and we're uh, not taking advantage of the opportunities that we have, which we have. This has got to change if we're going to bring this game out of all right how do you turn it around trailing 14 to 6 then i still think that we can control the football we've shown signs of being able to do this and i think that we can do it and, and uh, control the ball as long as the wins to our face anyway maybe we can get a little bit dangerous when the wins to our back coach i know you have a job to do we'll let you get right at it yeah. 
of the Pioneer Bowl, Massachusetts, Florida A&M will continue after station identification. We're back at the Pioneer Bowl and at halftime, the Rattlers of Florida A&M University leading University of Massachusetts Minutemen by a score of 14 to 6. This has been a great week here in Wichita Falls and we keep saying every year that maybe this is the year we're going to get good weather. But the Queen Rosalind Hill of Wichita Falls and her lovely court don't seem to matter and uh, well neither do the fans who are assembled here at Wichita Falls. It's a town of about 110,000 known for its great hospitality and they have been most hospitable all week. And Bill Fleming, you said the temperature is 46 degrees. Perhaps in the booth where you're working, it's 46 degrees. But on the field, it's mighty cold and the chilly that uh, is one of the highlights of Pioneer Bowl week here at Wichita Falls is a welcome treat. You may suffer a couple of days after that, but when it's Pioneer Bowl does not attract the attention or the national headlines of some of the other bowl games, but the folks in Wichita Falls are at least tied for first in enthusiasm and hospitality. It's become a happening, kicking off with the Mavericks barbecue on Thursday night. The Mavericks are at least that, a hundred Wichita Falls businessmen who give generously of themselves and ask only that others receive. People ate like condemned men. Then the city of 110,000 turned out for the Pioneer Bowl Parade on Friday afternoon under a big blue Texas sky and Rosalind Hill of Wichita Falls, Texas reigned as the Pioneer Bowl Queen. Bands, floats, pretty girls, and lots of good Texas music. But the highlight of the pregame activities is the annual Chili Powwow. Some 60 entries competed. The grand champion, Chili Cooker, is Red Emerson, a young man of 63 from Chillicothe, Texas. That's a cow town about 67 miles northwest of here. Red, I had a chance. Well, poised to make the entrance is the celebrated band of Florida A&M under the direction of Dr. William Foster. So ladies and gentlemen, sit back and enjoy some great rhythm and some great music. number played by Florida A&M University Marching Band.
Florida A&M University Marching Band. And we will be turning to Memorial Stadium here in Wichita Falls, Texas, for more of the Pioneer Bowl right after this message. With only two instructors and 15 students, Today, this land-grant institution, which is part of the State University System of Florida, has an enrollment of over 6,000 students and a faculty and staff of 1,100. Students now can choose from 76 majors in seven schools and colleges, the Colleges of Education, Humanities and Social Sciences, and the College of Science and Technology, the Schools of Architecture, Business and Industry, Nursing, and the School of Pharmacy. In addition, FAMU has a Department of Continuing Education and offers master's and doctorate degrees in its graduate studies division. FAMU's academic program is geared toward educating students for viable professional careers. The university also conducts research and performs community services. Major attractions include the world-renowned Marching 100 Band and the only black archives recognized by the Florida State Legislature. This is Florida A&M University. Bill Fleming along with Frank Broyles and Dave Diles at the Pioneer Bowl of Wichita Falls, Texas. And only 30 minutes remain now of the 1978 college football season for these teams in Division I AA. Lord A&M out in front, and here's how the scoring went. In the first quarter, Vidiello kicked the field goal to put Massachusetts in front. Then early in the second quarter, he kicked another one. It was six to nothing. However, Florida A&M University came back, and after a brilliant 53-yard run by McFadden, a score by Albert Chester on the option. The extra point was good. And then before the half ended, Chester scored again to make the score 14 to 6. And it should be mentioned, Frank Broyles, that all of the scoring except one field goal was done with the win. That's the way it is in Texas with the wind blowing about 25 or 30 miles an hour. You don't have much offense or any field position when the other team can kick at the length of the field and start it on the start you on the 20. It's hard to move 80 yards against the wind, Bill, because you can't throw the ball. It's all running. You're in a goal line offense. The defense has moved into a goal line defense, and three or four yard gain is a pretty good gain. So the scoring has been done except for the block kick. The block kick by Massachusetts gave them field position, and ended up with a field goal. I believe we only have had one completed pass in the first half. Here are the stats. As you can see, the thing that sticks right out at you, 235 four yards rushing for Florida A&M. And this has been the difference. When they were going against the wind, they made a few first downs, gave uh, Massachusetts a little bit in field position, but nothing to where they could put any more than three points on the board going with the wind. Ten first downs to five for Massachusetts. The edge definitely in favor of Florida A&M. And in passing, 0 for 5 for Florida A&M and one out of four and one intercepted. The reason is the wind, Bill. You, when you throw into the wind, the ball, it, it just won't go where you want it to go unless it's a perfect sparrow. And then when you throw in with the wind, it takes off and sails and it's very difficult to complete a pass. Florida A&M's celebrated marching band. Really some of the great showmen in college Music out on the field right now. And Florida A&M's football team, leading here by eight points at halftime, is coming back onto the field. They rarely get an opportunity to see their famous band performing. There you see the big rattler on the cape of the drum major. So we'll be returning to Memorial Stadium in Wichita Falls, Texas, for more of this Pioneer Bowl right after this. Woodrow Hayes in Ohio State. Uh, I know what Woody would have told his guys at halftime. What did you tell them? Well, Dave, of course, I'm proud of being a part of Woody Hayes' program. And uh, we simply told them, you know, no national championship has been won on 30 minutes of play. We got another half to play, and anything could happen. Did you change anything? Seems to be running well on offense, and your defense is playing alert, aggressive ball. Dave, I'd like to change the win. It seems like we've had more than our share of the win right in our face. And I, you know, I'd like to have it behind me, but if we can hold this third quarter, uh, we might be all right. We'd like, we're trying to get the win. It's a factor. Okay, Rudy Hubbard, coach at Florida A&M, trying for a national championship, now back upstairs. And Woody Hubbard made a very significant point, Frank Broyles, the fact that he, if his team can hold here while they have to go into the win, and while Massachusetts has the win in the third quarter, 
I think he feels very optimistic about the outcome. All coaches been in this position where at the halftime you say, fellas, we want to win in the fourth quarter, which means we're going to start with the ball on our 20 at the half, and we're going to take it, and we're going to punch out first downs. We're going to knock them off that line of scrimmage. We're going to protect the football, and we're going to punch out three or four first downs before we have to kick. That is the secret to winning when you're in the playing and win like this. Mike McEvely, you're getting a good look at him. I don't know whether he was affected by running into that bench head first uh, in that first quarter or not. Uh, I don't believe so, really. But uh, it certainly was a, quite a shock to his system when he when he went in there full steam. It actually took a nick right out of the wooden bench. Here we go. Vidiello's kick sailing down deep. No return on this one. So. Florida a and will take over the football, first and 10 on the 20-yard line. Defensively, John D'Amato, who's played an outstanding first half. Dunk Gillen, Benoit, Dan Petrie, John McDonald. And now they're firing up in there. Having to hold and trailing eight to nothing. First and 10 on the 20. The Rattlers of AM. And here goes Solomon getting a quick five. Maybe six. Duncan Gillen making the stop. Steve McInnes as a linebacker. Along with Joe McLaughlin, who has been outstanding in the first half. Steve LeMay, the cornerback. Kevin Sullivan, who is on the sidelines right now because of a bad ankle. And Bob Manning got bowled over on that great run. Kevin McGuire. Filling out the right side. McLaughlin, incidentally, has a total of eight tackles so far in the game. Chester stumbles a bit. However, he gets loose and goes to the 38-yard line before he's forced out of bounds. Bob Manning chasing him out. Number 21. Let's watch Chester on the replay. Here's what a quarter. Watch him accelerate to the right. He's going to the right. It's a busted play a little bit. Watch the matter. The matter. The end number 45. Just can't catch him. Chester turns up the field. Goes out of bounds. First down. First and 10 on the 37-yard line. We've just begun the third quarter of play from Wichita Falls, Texas, for the national championship in Division I AA. Florida A&M University against the University of Massachusetts. On the end around, it is Chris Douglas. It's actually a halfback around, but he gets about 12 or 13 yards before it's diagnosed. And Joe McLaughlin, number 51, the man to bring him down. On the replay, you will see the slot reverse where they fake to the tailback, hand right back to Douglas, number 42. This gives good blocking angles for the right side of the line. They seal off everybody inside, and Douglas picks up another first down. And the Rattlers are moving, leading 14 to 6, and they're going against this win that everybody's been talking about. McFadden gets only a yard, maybe not that much. Waiting for him was Steve T. Lander. When you're going against the wind, you should make mention that you try to get three, four, or five yards on first down with a good straight ahead play so that you don't get behind in yardage and end up with third and seven or eight and have to throw into this wind because it's practically impossible. Florida AM has 265 yards in rushing so far today. Second down and nine. Again, that halfback slot back around, and it's Bobby Hawkins. And he gets very close to a first down at the 42-yard line. The reason for this, I think the viewers should understand, that Massachusetts is slanting to the field. Florida a &M comes out in the formation, flanking to the field. They slant this way and leaves them short of defensive people on the boundary. And reverse play is a way to make yardage. Steve Tlander is down. Timeout. There's a break in the action here at Memorial Stadium. And we'll be right back after this pause. The, uh, Steve T. Lander, defensive end of Massachusetts, went down on the last play. I had mentioned earlier that this young man has shown more fortitude in his three years of playing varsity football. He has been in the operating room three separate occasions, twice for knee operations, once for an operation on the hand. And now, uh, Frank, it looks to me as, as if maybe there's a little bit too much excess movement in that knee. Well, the trainer was using the exercise to test whether the ligaments were damaged. You hold the ankle and slide the knee backward and forward to see how much movement there is. Evidently, there's a lot that's too bad because he is a fine football player, and you just don't need four operations from the game of football. A courageous story 
of Steve Tlander, and it doesn't look like he's going to be able to return to action and his playing days at Massachusetts have ended apparently here at Wichita Falls today. His team is trailing 14 to 6 as he is helped to the sidelines by Joe McLaughlin and another teammate. So Todd Davis, number 73, has gone in as a replacement. Now Davis normally is a defensive tackle who will switch over to the end spot. We have a third down and two. Florida A&M in possession, leading in this ball game, 14 to six. It's on the 41-yard line of Massachusetts. Handoff goes to Solomon, and he gets his first down at the 38-yard line. Well, Frank, I know you're looking forward to that great confrontation in the Sugar Bowl this year. Number one ranked Penn State against number two Alabama. That should be a great football game. Joe Turno has had a sensational year. Bears football team at Alabama started strong. Slacked off a little bit in the middle, but they finished like a typical Alabama Red Elephant football team, Crimson Tide, by blowing the other teams out. 12 minutes, 54 seconds to go. Third quarter, first and 10, the ball on the 39-yard line. And once again, taking the ball is Bobby Hawkins from the slot back position, but this time it doesn't fool anybody, and he is dropped back at the 48-yard line. And it's Joe McLaughlin who wraps his big arms around him, finally bringing him down. John McDonald, 57, also in on the stop. When you go the well one time too many, this particular occasion, uh, Massachusetts was not sprinting to the inside. Of course, we see number 89 in trying to slow him down first, and then others, number 57, John McDonald, gets in the play. And a Merry Christmas to all of you in the Wichita Falls area. Here goes McFadden. Boy, if he gets running room, he is dangerous. Gets it up to the 40-yard line. Ray Benoit, number 89, brings him down, and it'll be now a third down and 11 to go. Here it is on the replay. Look at the gaping hole that McFadden has to run through, and this big, wide line splints creates these natural openings for the ball carry. Third and 11. Big play coming up for the Rattlers right here on the 40-yard line of Massachusetts. McFadden makes the cut inside, and he is stopped by McLaughlin. Coming up fast is Bob Manning to help out on the tackle, number 21. But McLaughlin makes the stop with fourth down now. Joe McLaughlin is all over the field. Watch him read the quick pitch. It's the sweep. He's probably slowed down just a moment to see if he's going to get cracked back by the wide receiver, but when he finally decides where he's going to run, he moves over and makes the play. He's an outstanding linebacker. With the fourth down and five, the Rattlers send Sammy Knight out wide to the left, and now they're taking a look at T-Lander on the sidelines. Eleven and a half minutes to go in the third quarter. Florida A&M is out in front, 14 to six. Chester makes the move, but he doesn't get his first down as McDonald bear hugs him to the ground at the 32-yard line. Let's go down to Dave Dials on a report uh, on T-Lander. All right, we're with Dr. Ralph. Doctor, I know Steve has had surgery on that very knee twice. What does it look like today? It looks like he has a sprain of the medial collateral ligament. Mm -hmm. Just a sprain, but it would preclude his going back in today, would it not? Probability is that true. Man. Back up to Bill Fleming. Well, in a way, that's kind of good news, uh, Dave. Uh, the, even though he won't play again today, at least it sounds like it's not as serious as torn ligaments. First and 10 for the Minutemen on the 32-yard line. They're trailing by eight. McEvely fires it. It is deflected and incomplete. Jesse Spaulding, number 55, got a big hand on it. Jesse Spaulding, the linebacker, did not take the fake to the back up the middle. It was supposed to freeze him. He dropped right back across into the middle. And again, dragging across, was covered. Incomplete, fine play by Spaulding. That... Uh, <laughs> well, by golly, sometimes you just need a pacifier. <laughs> Second and ten. McEvely ducks in the hole. First time he's really run today, and he comes up to the 38. Willie Spencer, number 71, making the stop. Good look at some of the defenders now for Florida A&M, Frank Grady. Willie Spencer, who's been very much in evidence here today at 255. Winifred Allen started at nose guard in place of Oliver. Algie Hendrith has played well at 240 pounds, and Sheldon Hodge, the defensive right end. 
Third and three for the Minutemen at the 39 on their own territory, trailing 14 to six, third quarter. Quarterback draw. Ooh, he almost got that first down. And then Jesse Spaulding buckled him back. And uh, Willie Spencer and Joe Yates. Joe Yates, the man in on the tackle on this last play. Jesse Spaulding in on the tackle on the last play. Along with Daryl Tyson. Warren Sadler. Cliff Price. Dorsey Hutchinson. Very close to a first down. As they bring the chains for the far side of the field, 10 minutes and 28 seconds to go in the third quarter. 14 to 6, Florida AM out in front. That's about a foot short. Fourth down and a foot. And I don't know, Frank, at this stage in the ball game with the wind behind you, maybe you ought to take advantage of everything you can get. What do you think? Oh, that sounds like a fan, Bill. <laughs> That's what our fans would yell every time. And you might do it and it would probably win. But if you didn't, you lose the ball game, I would think. They're playing percentages. All right. <laughs> but I'm, I stand chastised. Here's Fontaine. He had some good punts in the first quarter with the win. He drives the safety man back. Gifford Ramsey has a little trouble with the ball, and he is hit. There's a marker down. Number 20, Gifford Ramsey takes it up to the... Marker down was up about the 20-yard line. line. Yeah. Making the stop for the Minutemen, number six. Well, I believe one. Joe Yates, number 91, they dropped the flag in his area, and he was blocking below the waist, which is against the college rule. Well, you just couldn't have uh, any worse field position than they're going to have. That'll be about on the four-yard line, the way I look at it. First and ten. So with ten minutes and eight seconds to go in this third quarter, we'll return to Memorial Stadium here in Wichita Falls, Texas, for more of the Pioneer Bowl right after this. This fun. Punning statistic, Frank Royals. Well, the kicking game can be an offensive weapon. Massachusetts has kicked twice with the win. 52 and 55 yards, three times against it. Florida a &M has kicked twice against the win, 12 and 12, and once we're with the win, it was blocked, which gives them zero. First and 10 for Florida A&M. Handoff on a delay. Goes to Mike Sullivan, and he only gets about uh, two. Well, that's how the running backs have done so far today with Melvin McFadden. Running that big one, 53 yards. That's the difference in the ball game. A&M has been able to have some consistent running attack. Passing is just about zero because of the strong wind. Looks like a man from the mountains. 9.34 to go, third quarter. Second down and about eight. Handoff goes to Bobby Hawkins. Bobby Hawkins gets it up to about the eight-yard line, and that's all. Ball Swarming here. defense knocks him out of bounds. Bob Manning, number 21. In this position, you try to get your defense up tight, figuring that they are not going to throw the ball. They're going to force and penetrate and try to stop them and force and kick into this win and field position and get right back in the football game, Bill. Well, it's been an interesting game. Massachusetts went out in front three to nothing at the end of the first quarter on a field goal by Vitiello. Then when Massachusetts had it first and goal to go on the one-yard line on a block kick, they had to settle for three. That may very well be the story of the game so far. Then after leading six to nothing, they have fallen behind 14 to six. And on that third down play, Joe McLaughlin comes through to knock down Albert Chester. So it'll bring up a fourth down. I think our fans, watch this tremendous play by McLaughlin. This is a key down. They've got to force the punt. He gets away from the blocker, number 61, Hayes, and gets across and tackles the quarterback on the option play, preventing a first down and forcing a punt into this win. Keep in mind that the blocked punt earlier could be a psychological thing now for Sam Knight. He knows how fast that line's going to come. Well, they held back, but the wobbly, funny-looking kick comes off like a top and goes back to about the nine-yard line where it was touched. <laughs> Three yards on the kick. Oh, Bill, that just terrible. Let's watch it on the replay. He actually gets the ball, sparrow it, and you, if he would just turn it over. You've got to turn the ball over with a tight sparrow, but the wind's going to catch it and going to bring it right back to his line of scrimmage. I'll tell you something you don't see very often. The punter downed his own kick. You don't want to see it. <laughs> we'll be back 
right after this pause. Bill Fleming along with Frank Royals and Dave Dials at the Pioneer Bowl of Wichita Falls and the Minutemen of Massachusetts are going to try to be opportunists here. After a two-yard punt, they have the ball first and goal to go on the eight-yard line of Florida A&M and trailing 14 to 6, third quarter. Handoff to Hank the Tank Sorrell. The human cannonball goes to the three. Number 30, Hank Sorrell. Bill, when you have any doubts, run straight at them. If you're going to be a good football team, you've got to do this. And there was a little hole, a little cavity opened up because Henrice planted to the inside, and the Sorrell made a nice game. Just inside the three-yard line, second and two and a half yards for a touchdown. Massachusetts trailing by eight here in the third quarter. Pitch goes to Dent, cuts inside, close. No, I don't think so. On the one foot line, Jesse Spaulding stopped him. Boy, this Florida A&M defense has been something down close. This is the sweep where the halfback Dent is just going to try to find some running room. Spaulding gets a piece of him, and then number 67, Harold Oliver helps on the play. Remember this, Bill. Massachusetts had the ball right here, first down, and could not score in the in the second quarter. A little more beef now as the deep man in the eye is Pedro, who scored three touchdowns last week. He gets the ball, he scores it. Cliff Pedro goes in to score, and we have a 14 to, 14 to 12 game, and we have a decision coming up on whether you go for two. They should go for two right here and uh, try to tie the ball game up. They try and decide whether to put the ball over on the hash mark or operate from the middle of the field. Most of the time, Bill, in this situation, you practice one two-point play. You use it for one game if you need to, then the next week you come up with another play. The most, the best one is crossing ends. Most teams will go the crossing ends in a situation like this sometime during the year. All right, they're gonna to go to that pro set now with Sorald on the right. Pedro on the left, McEvely the quarterback, 14 to 12. McEvely is going to try to pass it. He's being harassed there. He throws to the end zone incomplete. A Rattler got his hand on it, just in time. So there it is, 14 to 12. And of course, that score was a direct result of a two yard punt in which the kicker Sam Knight actually downed his own punt at the eight. If our viewers will watch, the punt goes, starts out pretty good with a little spiral. The wind brings it right back, and when it hits, it hits right on his point and runs right back towards the goal line. And finally, there, uh, the A&M kicker, number three, Knight, downs the football. That's incredible, Bill. I've never seen that before in my life. <laughs> You know, we're not laughing at Sam. It's just the doggone wind conditions here are abominable. And you know, Frank, it's something that I've heard many coaches say, you can't simulate that in practice. No, you can't, unless you practice in it every day. Out it goes. Once again, I don't think we've had a, more than one return all day. And uh, actually, one man, McGriff, thrilled everybody with it. Steve Tlander has come back in the ball game. How about that? I can't believe it. What a courageous young man. No wonder they play him at both ends, substitute. They say he's a real leader. That when things get tough, he takes charge and fires up that defensive football team. Four minutes ago, he was helped off the field, couldn't even put pressure on his leg, and now he's back in. 6.54 to go, third quarter. Massachusetts now trailing by two. Back on defense they go. Oh, the right side of the offensive line breaks. It's going to cost them five. Bill, you, that just changes your strategy. When you've got to go against the wind, first and 10, you make three and a half yards to try, you make a first down. Now you have to go at five yards away. On the replay, watch the quarterback tell the wing back. He's looking over to tell the wing back to go in motion, and Hawkins doesn't go, and finally Mills, number 72, jumps off sides. First and 15. Looked like T-Lander broke a little early on the uh, defense. So Bobby Hawkins, although he is surrounded and thrown down, I believe it's going to just be a reciprocal penalty here, and uh, it'll be another first and 10. 
Bill, I think our viewers probably understand that when you have a penalty, it puts you into a long play situation, and that's exactly what happened. Florida a &M went to a reverse play, knowing that the straight-ahead plays are not likely to make a first down in three tries. Preliminary signal from the officials. Watch T. number 54. He was trying to anticipate the count. They staggered the count, and he's offside, giving a and a, a good break right here, bringing it back first and 10 where they started a couple of plays before. This has been a relatively free penalty game. Uh, a and has four penalties for a total of 29. Massachusetts, four penalties for a total of 27. First and 10, back where we started from at the 20. Oh, McFadden is pretty tough. He shrugs off a couple of tacklers in there that would have thrown him for a loss. And finally, Manning brings him down. Gained uh, pretty close to five yards on the play. Yes, it is definitely uh, coat weather here. In fact, fur coat weather. McFadden has carried the ball 15 times today for 131 yards, the leading ball carrier on the field. Pretty good for a substitute. He's in place of Ike Williams, who was injured in the last game against Grambling and could not play in this game or the game against Jackson State last week. An 8.7 average for McFadden today. Second and five. There's Solomon grinding out about three. And once again, Joe McLaughlin, number 51, is down there at the bottom along with Ray Benoit, number 89. They tried. Let's go back to that thing that Bob Pickett said. He said that his team has got to get out in front here in this third quarter, and Rudy Hubbard is hoping to stop him. Here's McLaughlin taking on the blocker, number 61, Hayes, tossing him back and making, helping on the tackle. Bill, Massachusetts has got to get two touchdowns this quarter when they've got the win to their backs that they hope to win. Or a three-pointer, which would put them out in front 15 to 14 with the win. Solomon. Mm, very close to a first down, but I don't think he made it. I think he's about a foot short. That is a critical third down play. As the old coach said, please give me a good spot. Please give me a good spot. I need it. Well, they're going to measure, Bill. Oh, there has never been uh, really a more important one in this ball game so far than this one. The, the I believe the front of the ball is touching the 30-yard line. I think it is. Looks to me like it's the first down. It is, by inches. Oh, well, you can see that look of frustration. First and 10, the ball is on the 30. Not much. Mike Solomon, the ball carrier. Number 25, Mike Solomon. Joe McLaughlin will be down at the bottom someplace, you can bet on. And the ball is placed at the 31 and a half. In maybe of two, 518 to go in this third quarter. Keep in mind that Florida AM has had the win in their faces in this third quarter. Massachusetts has had the advantage of it. Massachusetts had scored, but they're still trailing 14 to 12. Chester coming out, making the deep pitch to McFadden, and out of bounds he goes at the 33-yard line. That'll bring up a third down. About seven. Of course, I was talking to Frank Royals a little bit earlier about the Sugar Bowl game. There's more exciting action coming up, too. First of all, the Liberty Bowl game, which ought to be an exciting matchup, LSU and Missouri. That'll be on the 23rd, and then the Gator Bowl game, Clemson and Ohio State. Did Clemson come back strong this year, last year under Charlie Pell, and then won the uh, conference championship this year with a 10-1 record? Now with a third and six for Florida A&M. They have the ball in their own territory at the 34. Albert Chester pitches it deep. Wayman Daniels has the ball, and he has dropped. Steve LeMay coming through. So Wyman Daniels cannot get the ball upfield. It'll bring up a fourth down situation. A good number defensive 30, play by Martin number 44, Steve ball LeMay. Carrier. Long yardage situation. You don't want to throw the ball in this position. So Steve Knight LeMay. comes back on the, uh, on the end of Daniels on the end Four of the round. Down. But uh, Massachusetts was not fooled on the long yardage situation. It's not likely to fool the defense. So once again, this kicker with uh, a 6.5 average today, Sam Knight having to Drill it into the wind again. This time he puts his foot into it and it wobbles off to the right, but gets a favorable bounce to midfield. And the ball is blown dead at midfield. It'll be first and ten for the minute man. 
We've been talking about the uh, bowl games. Let me just talk about the preview of the bowl games. Sugar and fun and who's number one? A show coming up tomorrow over most of these ABC stations. Previewing the Sugar Bowl matchup between number one Penn State, number two Alabama. A look at the matchups at the Liberty Bowl, the Gator Bowl, the Rose Bowl, Orange Bowl, and Cotton Bowl. So check your local listings for the time of this outstanding show on ABC in your area. 19-yard kick. That time, that's his longest of the day. And it gives Massachusetts the ball at the 49-yard line of the Rattlers. Massachusetts is trailing. McEvely on a good fake. Rifles it out. Incomplete. Kurtz slipped. Pass to number 25, Chris Kurtz. We're going to have two looks at Chris Kurtz. The wide receiver, first from the end zone, a bootleg pass, faking to the wing back. McEvely pulls up. Kurtz is wide open in behind the cornerback and, and in front of the uh, uh, safety man. Here he is again. Kurtz going down and out, pushing deep. Tyson, number 29, drops off of him, thinking he's going deep. Ball was a little bit thrown behind, incomplete. The Minutemen have four minutes and seven seconds with the win. They have a second down and 10. They're trailing 14 to 12, ball at midfield. Sorrell doesn't get much, only a couple of yards before he is dropped by Harold Oliver, number 67. An interesting story is Harold Oliver, a 226-pound nose guard who is playing today with a cast on his arm. But Oliver is the fastest nose guard probably in America. He has run in the 100-yard dash against Houston Bacteria, who I think is the fastest human in our country. And Mike McLaughlin is the center who is also playing with a cast on his left elbow. Has no extension of that at all. Has to strictly snap the ball with his right hand. McEvely getting pressure. Ducks it. Got a man. Has the ball. Number 84 is Balboni. And he carries it down and out of bounds at the 15-yard line. Tight end, Chuck Balboni. Bill, you were saying that McEvely can ad lib. Here it is, number 74. Hendrick is putting the pressure on him. Could have had him for a loss, but then the tight end Balboni rolls in behind the receiver when uh, McEvely scrambled a little bit and made a cr critical first down. So it's a first and 10 for Massachusetts with 3.19 to go in the third quarter. The ball is on the 14-yard line of Florida A&M. Dent getting a rush from Hendrick. Can't get loose. And number 15, Price, comes in to make the final stop at the 15, a loss of one. That was an outstanding play by Hendrick because he penetrated into the secondary, into the backfield, forced Dent to run in an area he didn't want to, and then Price came across and tackled him for a loss, something that you don't want to happen inside the other team's 20-yard line. Get some yardage on first down. They've done a good job of defensing uh, on, on Dent today. He's carried nine times for only 29 yards. McEvely, with a second and 12, is back to pass. Throws a hard one to the end zone, incomplete. Right off the fingertips of Marty Paglione, number 85. And oh. McEvely is mad because Pagl Paglione was wide open. He was in behind the cornerback. The safety man was held with a fake, but he held the ball a little bit too long, a little bit deliberate, and then Hutchison got over and broke up the pass. It brings up a third and 12. So all of the Massachusetts fans here biting their nails. Their team is trailing 14 to 12, and they know they're going to have to give up the wind here in another two and a half minutes. Here goes Dent, but he doesn't get much just to get that ball closer to the right side of the field. Now, I say the right side because this left-footed kicker has a tendency to hook it a little bit. Maybe play the wind. Well, that's, that's good percentage, Bill, if he's... A sidewinder and he's left footed, get over on the right hash mark, and he's looking more at the goalpost. He doesn't have to kick all the way across his body if he would was lined up on the left hash mark. So well, that, that play set up this 29 yard attempt by Alberto Vidiello. He can put his team in front if he makes it. It's up, it looks good. It is good, and Massachusetts has taken the lead with one minute and 57 seconds to go. In the third quarter, it is now 15 to 14 for the national championship in Division I AA of the NCAA football playoffs. Bill with a win. 
Now one of the most respected patriarchs of football is on the sidelines with Dave Dyles. Well, Jake Gaither is a man who only coached a quarter of a century and only won 83% of the time. I hate for us to come to you when your team has just fallen behind, Jake. I do, too. Well, it's one of those things that happens in football. For two years, I've seen a lot of these. Jake, coaching, of course, has changed a great deal, but you told me a while ago that young men are still the same as they always were. You just got to get to them. That's right. They're bigger, they're stronger. Sometimes I wonder whether they're as fast as we used to be, but they're playing good football. It's fundamentally sound. Football is essentially a game of fundamentals. Offense involves blocking, defense involves tacking. The kicking game is a part of it, and it's still that way. It was that way 42 years ago. Jake Gaither, the man who's best remembered for saying he likes his players agile, mobile, and hostile. Now back upstairs. Don't we all, Bill? <laughs> I guess so. Bobby Hawkins carried that kickoff back to the 29-yard line. So with a minute and 49 seconds to go in the third quarter, Massachusetts has taken the lead 15 to 14. The Rattlers of Florida A&M have the ball. A pitch back goes to McFadden. He makes the cut that is knocked down. Bowen squirts out at the 34. Looked like he went down and then all of a sudden had that extra spurt to the 34-yard line. Todd Davis making the initial stop. Bill, here's, here's McLaughlin, number 55, hesitates momentarily to see whether this will turn inside or outside, excuse me, McFadden, but he misses the tackle on McFadden. I'm not sure he knew where the ball was. Didn't look like it, did he? And it brings up a second down, about five or six to go. Florida A&M is trailing by one point. Solomon goes blasting through, and he might go. He's got the speed to do it. He's going to score. Mike Solomon broke through and goes 71 yards. Check that. Officially 65. It doesn't make much difference. It's still six points. Bill, we've said before, you run off tackle. You hope to make three or four yards. If you're a good football team, when you get an opportunity, you have the speed to take advantage of it, and that's what Solomon did. One missed tackle, and he was clear sailing for the touchdown. And the Florida A&M band comes right to its feet. Mike Solomon, uh, just a sophomore out of Tampa, has put his team out in front 20 to 15. Coleman puts the ball up, and it is perfect. And it's 21 to 15. Let's look at that again. Let's watch it from the end zone and see if we can see the splits. Look at the wide split to the right, and you see Solomon break in the line of scrimmage, and then he was missed by one of the linebackers. Safety man number 21, Manning, missed him. And then, of course, LeMay, 44, could not catch him. Going for short yardage, you get a break, and you turn it into a touchdown, Bill. That's what speed can do for you. McLaughlin, the linebacker, is starting to the left. He reads the flow of the backs, but he overruns the play. As number 61, Hayes, blocks him right down the line, and you can block in that area from behind, a clipping, what they call a clipping zone, where the clip is legal. And then, of course, LeMay, number 44, is trying to catch him, but he doesn't have the speed. Clear sailing all the way. Against a pretty good wind. How about a gale? <laughs> and getting the congratulations of his teammate is Mike Solomon, who now has rushed for 153 yards to become the leading rusher on the field. A big touchdown for Florida A&M University, a step closer to a national title. A minute and 31 seconds to go in the third quarter, 21 to 15. And remember, Massachusetts still has the wind to their backs. High floater, Dent will grab it. All right, kind of cost his momentum a little bit on that bobble, so he only gets it back to the 22-yard line. We remember him a week ago when he ran back a uh, kickoff 96 yards for a touchdown. But you got to catch the ball first. First and 10, 127 to go, third quarter. And Mike McEvely now will be tested here to see if he can utilize those seconds on the clock to keep that win. And uh, you can know that, that he's gonna try to get that ball threaded to some of his nimble receivers. However, on the draw, 
He gives the dent on the first play. Gains about three or four. Joe Yates, number 91, trips him up. Along with Jesse Spaulding. Boy, there have been a lot of good defensive players today, Frank. There certainly has. The linebackers for both teams have been outstanding. Spaulding and Yates read what we call the sprint draw, hand the ball off deep and run for daylight, but both linebackers diagnosed it, hit him right at the line of scrimmage. 61 seconds to go in the third quarter. Florida A&M is out in front by six. McEvely on a straight drop back. Goes long. Oh, he's got plenty on it, but it's too far. That wind just caught it and sailed it down there. Kevin O'Connor was the intended receiver. Bill, he, he's just trying to run what we call a go or a fly pattern. And Tyson, who's an all-conference football player, he has 11 interceptions. He thinks he's in perfect position. He's given enough cushion, but the wind takes the ball and just blows it on down, just like it has blown the kicks back towards the people who are kicking into the wind. Great day for Frisbees. <laughs> right. They throw in 100 yards today. 49 seconds to go in the third quarter. Massachusetts is now trailing by six and with the football in a third and seven. Fakes the uh, screen, throws it incomplete to death. And a look of frustration on the face of Mike McEvely. Hendrith and King put a lot of pressure on him there. I think uh, Florida a &M had one of their defensive linemen playing for the screen. He had no, made no attempt to rush the passer, recognized the screen, jumped right on Dent. McEvely had no one to throw to. Tim Fontaine is back, and it's very important here for him to get a good boot. Line of scrimmage will be the 26, and he gets one wobbly coming down, takes a pretty good bounce for Massachusetts. It's picked up by Sam Knight. Goes to the sidelines, scrambles down the sidelines, still on his feet, he's out of bounds. Nope, he's gonna have to come back. The official has marked it at the 34-yard line. Heck of a run, anyway. <laughs> Great effort. Heck of an effort by, by Sam Knight, their safety man. You can see Fontaine's kick. Yes. Knight lets the ball hit the ground, but catches it on the bounce. Let's see if he could have stayed in bounds right here on the right. Let's see, nope. Two, two, twice, left foot and right foot, touch the boundary, out of bounds. 33 seconds to go in the third quarter. And now Florida A&M University with the lead, 21 to 15. Has the ball at their own 34. Inside handoff to Hawkins. It doesn't go anywhere because riding him right to the ground there was number 57 McDonald. Did I say McDonald? Yeah, it may, it may have been number 67. I didn't quite catch it. McDonald and Petrie, number 67 is Petrie. Well, there's the blue sky to the north where all this cold wind's coming from, and it's kind of cloudy down toward the south out comes albert chester done a brilliant job today and that is the end of the third quarter and the rattlers say thank heaven we don't have to face the wind anymore so at the end of the third quarter the score is florida a and m 21 massachusetts 15. we'll be back for fourth quarter action after this message and a word from our local stations standing there their team is out in front as we go into the final 15 minutes McFadden bangs ahead for about maybe three, maybe four. Joe McLaughlin and Ray Benoit, numbers 51 and 89, bring them down. There are the a and band members. They certainly did themselves proud at halftime today, Frank. They were outstanding. It's the first time I've seen them in person. I've seen them on TV many, many times. They're probably one of the best in the country. It's kind of a funny move, isn't it? The, the, the way uh, Kenny Boggins comes up to the line, to the center, and then he goes out to his split end spot. Chester heaps. Nice hold. However, he's pretty short of real estate there, and he goes out of bounds at about the 41 yard line. <laughs> Here's a good look at the third quarter statistics, Frank. The same figures pop right up at you 363 yards. Total offense, none passing for Florida A&M. They've controlled the football, mostly going into the boundary. These last two quarters, Massachusetts has been going to the wide side of the field. With a fourth down and three, Massachusetts sends back the single safety man, Todd Powers. Sam Knight, oh, gets a bad snap, and it's blocked. Loose ball, picked up by number 54, T-Lander. 
John McDonald, number 57, blocked it, and T. Lander picked it up. There was a direct result of a bad snap, and he couldn't get it away. Bill, we, we mentioned while the, we were in commercial, during the commercial time, that uh, last time the Florida A.M. kicked with the win, Massachusetts rushed the kick and blocked it. No need to rush the kick when you're kicking into the win, but only when you're kicking with it. Here it is again. You can see it. Tremendous play. Gives them great field position and a scoring opportunity to go ahead in the football game. John McDonald was the man, number 57, who blocked it, and number 54, Steve Tlander, who had to be helped off the field in the third quarter, got the ball. Too bad he had a stumble there and fell. There's Dent, but he is really buckled by Spaulding. Number 67 on the bottom was Harold Oliver, along with Jim, Tim Shavers, who incidentally has been uh, elected one of the captains here as an honorary thing today. Rudy Hubbard on the sidelines, a bit upset, but his team is still out in front. 21 to 15, we're in the fourth quarter, 13.47 to go. The quarterback is Mike McEvely. He has the team on the 14-yard line of Florida A&M. Makes the pivot, goes into the stack, and he gets to the nine. Spalding in on the stop. Bill, going back to the block kick, you try to work with your lineman. Don't fall on the ball. Take your time and try to pick it up. You can't. If you kick it, move it on down the field unintentionally. It's still to your advantage. You're going to get it anyway. Don't fall on it. Go ahead and take it in the end zone. And had they been a little bit more alert, they could have walked in for the touchdown. Yeah, I think it's just that bum knee of t It just kind of gave out underneath him when he tried to run with it. There's a good look at Mike McLaughlin's hands. The center as he delivers to McEvely. The rush is on. McEvely's got his man open. It is Cliff Pedro. He's got a touchdown. A brilliant move by McEvely, who spotted Pedro. And Pedro, who was certainly the hero of last week's game with three touchdowns against Nevada Reno, comes up with the big one here. It ties the score at 21 all. And let me tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. If it stays tied, we have a tie-breaking formula. Here is McEvlin. The rush is to him. He makes a sensational play. He knows that Pedro is wide open, crossing pattern. There's nobody else in the ballpark on that side of the field until finally, number 19, Sadler comes up and gets involved. Vidiello to try for the crucial point that could break the tie. It is up. It is good. And Massachusetts has taken the lead. There's a break in the action here at Memorial Stadium, and we'll be right back because there's plenty to play after this pause. Well, it didn't take Massachusetts very long after blocking the punt. They went in on that pass from McEvely to Pedro, and I'll tell you, it was very reminiscent of the pass from Leach to Roosevelt Smith in the Ohio State-Michigan game. Same kind of situation. Sam Knight gets it back up to the 37 or 38-yard line. You know, so often, uh, Frank, it's the mark of a good quarterback who can can time that release just at the instant. At the same time, he's avoiding the rush. There was disaster right upon him as the rush was on him. He was able to step up and just dart the ball out, just deliver it, unload it like a dart, and was right on target. Just a sensational play on the circumstances. We have 12 minutes, 51 seconds to go in the ball game. And it is 22 to 21. Massachusetts is leading Florida A&M University. This is for the national championship in Division One AA. Pitchback goes to McFadden. Down he goes. Good hard tackle by Joe McLaughlin. He made sure that time throwing that shoulder into him. Watch McGriff, the All-American offensive guard, number 68. Watch him block McGinnis, number 41, right on the ground, what we call a chop block. You roll your shoulder underneath him, and he must fall like cutting the weed. You saw the ball roll there. That's the wind behind it. And Florida A&M has the advantage of the wind right now. Here is Albert Chester, the quarterback, getting some heat. Throws it is intercepted. It's intercepted at the 48-yard line, but there is a marker down. Kevin McGuire got the ball. He, he made a legal interception or legal reception, 
However, the marker was dealt, an ineligible man downfield. It is declined, and Massachusetts has the football. Bill, I, I'm surprised. Watch, I think a fan should watch Chester. He seems to be just throwing it to get rid of it, but he throws it right to McGuire. There's not a receiver around. You can see McGuire just waiting. They didn't move. Interception and a big break for Massachusetts. McFadden was there, but of course, uh, much deeper. And uh, a big play. 12 minutes, 11 seconds to go in the ball game. Massachusetts out in front, 22 to 21, and they have the ball. And I mentioned earlier that there is a tie-breaking format. I'd like to get into that for just a moment because it is uh, it's really kind of interesting. Here's Seralt wrestled by Jesse Spaulding. Down he goes. If these teams should be tied at the end of regulation play, they'll flip a coin. And then the team that wins the toss of the coin gets to choose offense or defense. They put the ball in play on the 15-yard line, and it's just played by the regular rules of football, except that the defense can't score. So if you, let's say, get it down to a fourth down situation, you've got five to go, might try a field goal. Puts a lot of interesting aspects to the game. We don't have a tie now, but it could happen. 22-21, Massachusetts in front, and Soralt has a good hole this time and manages to grind it forward for about three or four yards before Joe Yates, number 91, makes the stop. We have a third down coming up. And five. Chris Kurtz reporting into the lineup, number 25. Goes in at the split end spot. Rudy Hubbard on the sideline, a bit anxious now. His team is trailing. Marty Paglione. Luke Blake pass is what they've used on this situation before, Bill. Here's McEvely. He looks and it is almost intercepted. That ball was tipped. John King was there to receive it, but you know, there's where the win worked for Massachusetts. That was just like a great big old curveball, and it broke away from him. Throwing the ball across the field is a little bit dangerous, and that's what McEvely's doing. He's trying to throw a screen pass or a throwback pass, but King, number 77, was right there. Tackle could have intercepted and had clear sailing for a touchdown. Tim Fontaine with some pressure on him now to do the punting against the wind. Low snap, but he gets this one away and wobbly. This is only going to go about 12, maybe 10 yards, and it comes back. This may be a minus. In fact, he may have lost a yard. Bill, on the replay, we, we know as coaches, you must spiral the ball. In this kind of win, if you don't spiral it, it's going to come right back. And if you could just see it, it does come right back. Hits on the point, rolls right back towards the kicking team. And a loss of two. We'll return to Memorial Stadium in Wichita Falls, Texas, for more of the Pioneer Bowl right after this. Ten minutes, 51 seconds to go in the ball game. Florida A&M is trailing by one point. They have the ball at their own 49-yard line. Handoff goes to McFadden. He's got a good hole. Still on his feet. Be careful. Finally dragged down by Kevin McGuire. Boy, if he hadn't gotten it, if he hadn't snagged that ankle, I think McFadden might have gone. Bill, on the replay, you'll notice it is just the eye off tackle play. And again, Bob Manning misses McFadden. Finally, McGuire pulls him down. Here it is, a cutback. A gaping hole right through the middle of the line. Here we see Manning, number 21, missing. And back to live action as this play loses a yard. Mike Solomon is dropped by John D'Amato, number 45. 161 yards for McFadden today. And Solomon has 153. That's not too bad for a tandem offense, is it? I mean, that's what you want in this I formation with your fullback being able to be a threat also. It takes a lot of responsibility for the tailback. Those two I backs have accounted for more than 300 yards between them. Here is Albert Chester with a second and 10 throws. He is intercepted. Steve LeMay has got the ball at the 35 yard line. He is still on his feet and is dropped. Steve LeMay reached up and grabbed the football at the most critical point of its travel. Bill, we talked about that uh, Massachusetts was going to use a three-on-two pass coverage where the quarterback would squat and play short and the safety man coming over the top, and Chester must have seen LeMay standing right there. He throws the ball, trying to get over his head, which is impossible to throw the football through a man that tall. 
Sammy Knight was the intended receiver, and Steve LeMay comes up with the football. So two key interceptions here in the last nine minutes of play. We have 9.44 to go. First and 10, Massachusetts. Sorrell grinds ahead for a ball, almost four. Three or four, anyway. I'm sure they don't want to kick again. They're going to have to some way, if they want to win this ball game, make some first downs. Albert Chester talking to Rudy Hubbard. Scratch, crawl, do anything you can, Bill, but make four yards on each possession. Well, you know what I think it is? I think he knows that that ball is going to float on him, and he, he, the last two passes he's thrown short, thinking he was going to get a little lift from the wind, and he didn't get it. Dennis Dent, not getting very much. So, you know, even though he has the wind, I mean, the, the, the wind is fickle. Yes, it is. When you throw it, to, as you just mentioned, you're exactly right. When you throw it with the wind to the back, the ball can sail. You've got to keep it low, and when he did... LeMay intercepted. So we have a third and five situation for Massachusetts, and I'd say a rather big play for the Minutemen. They're leading in the ballgame, 22 to 21. We're in the fourth quarter, 8.41 to go for the national title in Division I AA. Florida AM on defense, wanting to get that football. Mix up in the backfield, and that'll bring, oh, it's still not recovered. Still loose. It squirts out, and Florida AM has the football at the 27 yard line. Joe Yates, number 91, comes up with the ball. Nobody could get it at wet bar of soap in the bathtub. The Minuteman had two. It's a busted play. Watch Dents at wing back. He collect, runs right into and collisions. McEverly, he reaches out and tries to get it. Now watch what happens. I can't explain it. First, the Minuteman dive on it. Dent, one of them, number nine. All of this is going to the, ag, to the Rattlers' advantage. Well, when they look at that again, it won't be amusing to the Minutemen, but it certainly was to see it unfold. 8.25 to go in the ballgame. There's Solomon breaking loose, still on his feet. Goes to the five. He's got a score. And Florida A&M goes out in front. That's some turnaround. Intercepted pass. Think you've got it made. Fumble on a third and five because you're going for a trick play, a reverse, and then on the first play, boom, right in for the touchdown. They had a, a on the play, you'll watch the safety blitz coming from your left of your screen, and when the uh, safety man didn't make the play, then the free safety, 21, Manning misses it, and then LeMay misses it again. Well, I'll tell you, the fans have had their money's worth here today, and we've had a Becca Fun doing this ball game. Uh, this is a national championship game, and it's 27 to 22. Time's been called by Florida A&M, so we'll return to Memorial Stadium in Wichita Falls for more of this Pioneer Bowl right after this. Now, tell Florida A&M called a timeout so Coach Rudy Hubbard could evaluate the situation. He has decided to go for two points. His team is out in front, 27 to 22, and they're lining up for two here from the three. 8.19 to go in the ballgame. Albert Chester is back, looks for a man. He has Bobby Hawkins, and he's got his tight end. He had two men in there. Emmanuel White caught the ball for the two. Bobby Hawkins was short, the wingman. So Emmanuel White catches it. And it is now 29 to 22. And I'll say again, the possibility of a tie is still there. It's there right now. And I'm sure that if, uh, if Massachusetts could score again, they would go for one and tie it up. This is a sprint out pass. And the tight end, Emmanuel White, number 84, is in behind all of the secondary. And Chester is right on target. Now let's go down to Dave Dials. Bill with me is Kevin Sullivan, who made a brief trip to the hospital, and the news, Kevin, was not good. Uh, they said I got a broken leg, and, uh, you know, last game of the year, but I don't know. I just wish it didn't happen today. Well, we still have a lot of exciting football left, and you got the best seat in the house to watch it anyway. Kevin Sullivan from Newburgh, Mass., now back upstairs to Bill and Frank. Well, we'll also point out that Kevin is only a junior, so his career is not over here today. He still has one more year, and I'm sure he'll be well, well back in shape by 1979. Here is the kickoff. Kevin O'Connor is deep, but the ball goes out of the end zone. That was Dent who had his hand on it. So here we are with eight minutes and 14 seconds to go in the ball game for the national championship in Division I AA of the NCAA national playoffs this year. 
The situation is simply that Florida A&M has taken the lead in the seesaw battle, 29 to 22, and Massachusetts has the football going against a very strong win. And as you can see, the sun has peaked out it once again this afternoon. It's been rather intermittent, a rather cold, blustery day here at Wichita Falls. First and 10, the ball is on the 20-yard line. McEvely hands it off to Dent, staggers forward for two, and that's about all he gets. Joe Yates, number 91, making the stop on him. Incidentally, uh, the scoring has been really unusual today. It was three to nothing at the end of the first quarter in favor of Massachusetts, then six to nothing in the second. And then went ahead seven to six and then 14 to six at halftime. Then it was 14 to 12. Then it was 15 to 14, Massachusetts. Then 21 to 15, A&M. Then 22 to 21, Massachusetts. And now it's 29 to 22. Here's Dent, had a good head of steam and he was stopped by Winifred Allen. Winfred Allen, who is playing in place of Harold Oliver as the nose guard. Bill, a Oliver, excuse me, Allen just penetrated on a slant charge, got back in the backfield, and made an excellent play. Here again with long yardage. They've been going for some type of bootleg pass to try to make the necessary yardage. Incidentally, we'd like to thank all of our friends at our affiliate KTUL, Channel 8 in Tulsa, for all of their help and cooperation. Jimmy Lake, Tom Goodgame, the entire gang. We're proud of that affiliation with KTUL. Always make our stay very pleasant. Incompleted pass. Balboni on the receiving end, and it's fourth down. Would you hate to be the punter, Bill? Oh, it's just a nightmare to have to kick into that win. Bob Pickett knows full well what the odds are now with his team facing this vicious win with 7.05 to go, and Tim Fontaine has to get a good kick away here. I'm wondering, too, about the center snaps. We've had so many that have fallen short. Does the wind affect the center snap at all? Well, Bill, it's supposed to help it. The, when you're kicking into the wind, obviously the center is snapping the ball with the wind. Normally, you think you can get the ball off much faster and you should get a better snap. Tim Fontaine gets a good snap this time and kicks a low line drive, and it's a good kick. Comes across midfield and will be down at about the 45 or 46-yard line. So with the break in the action here at Memorial Stadium, we'll be right back after this pause. Well, there's the situation with Florida A&M in possession of the football, leading by seven points. And they're six minutes and 58 seconds away from a national championship to be determined on the football field. And here's Bobby Hawkins swinging wide, and he has nothing but white shirts ahead of him. Loss of four on the play. John D'Amato, number 45, hot on his trail, and number 41 in there. Right behind him was Steve McInnes. D'Amato is a two-time All-Yankee Conference defensive end, and he recognized the reverse coming back to the short side of the field, and he waited and threw it for a loss. Six twenty-five to go. Albert Chester, the quarterback, with a second and 14 situation. McDonald putting the heat on over there. Chester cuts up field, and he's going to be cut down. Dan Petrie hot on his trail. Number 67 brings him down at the 46-yard line. Bill, that was a run or pass option. Chester had the op opportunity to throw if the defensive men came forward to contain him if they laid back run. When you have a running quarterback, that's a good play in this particular situation. 29 to 22, the Rattlers of Florida A&M University leading the Minutemen of Massachusetts in the national title game. Third down and 10. Chester on the delay, gives to McFadden. He's got a first down at the 40-yard line. Bob Manning making the stop. Boy, he gets a, a head of steam fast. Bill, this is the play that O.J. Simpson made, was made famous because the eye formation cut play, you get good blocking angles, you pull the card, the linebacker thinks it's a pass, they drop back, and you have good running room. McGriff, the pulling guard, is going to block McKinnis, number 41, right here, pulling around, blocking number 68, All-American. They have two All-Americans in this ball game. Bruce Kimball also from Massachusetts is All-American. And Solomon gets only a yard on that first and 10 situation, just inside the 40. It's interesting to note that McFadden has 176 yards and Solomon has 181. 
So between them, they have 357 yards. That is amazing. 430 yards rushing for A&M and the Minutemen 107. What a turnaround from what we expected at the top of the show. And a close ball game, 29 to 22, and an issue still in doubt. 450 to go, second and nine on the 39-yard line. A&M, McFadden managed to shrug away from one man, but is buckled by Joe McLaughlin. And it will be a third down situation at about the 38-yard line. I'll say this, the one thing that the Minutemen want to do here is to keep A&M away from field goal range. Now they still are within striking distance, Frank, 29 to 22, but three more points would make it extremely difficult. A&M has not completed a pass in this ball game. All rushing yardage, zero passing. Third and eight. Here is Chester. He finds an opening on the left side. He's going to get a first down out of bounds at the 27-yard line. Quick reaction by Albert Chester. On the replay, Chester drops back to pass. It's a pattern where they're running two receivers against three defenders. There's nobody open. And actually, they had a safety blitz on. And so when Chester decided to scramble out the backside, no one's at home. First down. First and 10, the ball is on the 27 and a half yard line. Three minutes, 59 seconds to go in the ball game. The Rattlers of A&M of Florida, out in front by seven. They have the ball. There's a big hole by Solomon, and Solomon gets quickly through for eight to the 20. Bob Manning making the stop. Would you say Manning, the safety man, has figured in a lot of plays? They have had gaping holes with those wide splits. Pop the play right through the line of scrimmage, and the only man between the ball carrier and six points is the safety man, Bob Manning. Three and a half minutes to play. Ball on the 20-yard line. McFadden with 177 yards today, and Solomon with 188. It's been a dynamic one-two punch. Chester hands it off to Solomon. He's got some daylight. Touchdown! I don't know whether he's lying there, just being grateful to be in the end zone. <laughs> the only Thomas thing that probably could have happened, he must have fallen right on the football, and uh, it must have forced the air out of him, and he a little bit... Uh... Let's watch the replay. It's an off-tackle play, and poor Bob Manning, the safety man, it's just a little bit of a mismatch right here. First, McLaughlin misses him, then uh, he cuts back in behind Manning, and finally... Uh, Jesse comes over to try to get in the play, but it's too late. And Solomon trots off the field. He now has 208 yards and three touchdowns today. And an eye formation fullback back unheard of. That's unheard of. Vince Coleman to try for the extra point. He puts it up. And there is a marker down. It looks like roughing the kicker. The ball had gone wide. Bill, unfortunately, they, I believe they piled on Albert Chester, the quarterback, and he's holding his knee. I hope that he's not seriously injured. The score 35 to 22, and the marker went down, which means, and I did not see a signal, Frank, did you, whether the kick was good? I didn't think it was. It was not good. McGriff, the All-American offensive guard, is pulling on this particular play around and watch him block right on McGinnis, number 41, delay him just long enough for Solomon, the ball carrier, to get away from him. One of the things that we were always reluctant to do to have our quarterback, our top quarterback, hold for extra points and field goals for that reason. McGinnis came in on a blitz, on a blitz right up the middle. He didn't intentionally uh, rough the holder, but watch number 41, the left of your screen, has a little opening. He dives to try to block it, but he falls right on the leg. You see his right leg is sitting up a little bit and his cleats are locked in the turf. Very dangerous. So Albert Chester is being helped off the field. He's had a brilliant day today. He has led his team to a 35-22 lead, 
And make no mistake about it, even though he has not completed a pass today, I think his ball handling in the backfield and the running of the ball club cannot uh, be overlooked too, uh, too much. That's exactly right, uh, Bill, but uh, Chester did a magnificent job of handling the option play and also of audible and that, uh, changing the play at the line of scrimmage when the defense overshifted. And that's one of the big things that's happened successfully for him in this last half. He has a very capable replacement, Robert James. And timeout here is being called by Coach Rudy Hubbard to talk it over. It looks like they're going to go for two. We'll return to Memorial Stadium here in Wichita Falls, Texas for more of the Pioneer Bowl right after this. John Brennan for Capital Dodge, now with the largest supply of four-wheel drives in Florida. Many models to choose from, only at... Florida A&M will go for two now with Robert James as the quarterback. Three minutes and 15 seconds to go in the ballgame. James back to pass. Throws one, end zone, incomplete. Knocked away at the last second from the intended receiver. Bob Manning was the man who stopped it, and so the score remains 35 to 22, and anything is possible. In the Independence Bowl today, East Carolina at halftime leading Louisiana Tech. And in the first Garden State Bowl, Arizona State defeats Rutgers 34 to 18. And don't forget over most of these ABC stations, ABC's Wide World of Sports, it'll be the Southern 500. And I think you'll enjoy all of that action together with be the there, World High Bill? Diving Championship, the World Show Jumping Championship. That'll be at 5 o'clock Eastern and Pacific Time, 4 o'clock Central on most of these ABC stations. Excuse me, Bill, aren't you going to be at the Southern 500? We always enjoy doing that one from Darlington, South Carolina. Vince Coleman will kick off. The band members of Florida A&M having reason to blow their horns today, 35-22. Bill, I can't remember ever having two backs rush for 200 yards in the same game. And we're reaching that possibility as Solomon's gone 208 and McFadden has 177. It would be a first as far as I can ever remember. Yes, and I think that's an important thing to remember too, Frank, that it uh, was against an outstanding defensive team from Massachusetts. The, the Massachusetts defensive coaches just felt that the scheme was just perfect for them. They were playing for a lot of passes and they moved over and they've been hurt with the runs up the middle and back to the weak side. I'm just wondering, uh, Frank, if we can get into that wide split in the line. It seems to me that that was the befuddling thing as they'll have to kick over here with the kick going out of bounds. Believe me, it's befuddling. The defensive coaches have stayed up late at night trying to figure out when do we move inside? How wide is, does the split have to be before our lineman goes in and takes it? You have to go in and try to make something happen. Well, our defensive coach, Jimmy Johnson, who's just taken the head job at uh, Oklahoma State, he wouldn't let you split over a yard. You move over the yard and he'd make his tackles move in or he'd make the nose guard move over that side and try to penetrate and the splits gradually shrink. When you do that, they gradually shrink to where they're normal if you'll take advantage of them. Well, it's a good topic for discussion as we get ready for the second kick by Vince Coleman. Three minutes and 15 seconds to go. The Minutemen of Massachusetts are trailing in the ball game by 13 points now, and the kick sails over the head of Dent. Just want to remind you that the final regular season NFL game here on ABC's Monday Night Football comes up live, 9 o'clock Eastern time. The New England Patriots against the Miami Dolphins. Would we be uh, wrong to say we hear the rumor that Chuck Fairbanks is uh, considering going to the University of Colorado? Is that a fact? That, well, that was in the paper as a rumor. I don't know whether it's true or not. Well, I, maybe we'll find out more from <laughs> Frank that, and Howard. Wouldn't that shake it? And that here's way. the pass to Hank Sorrell. Down he gets about six. Joey Yates brings him down along with Jesse Spaulding. Well, this definitely has not been a day for the ball to be in the air. This very strong win has certainly hampered both teams today. There's a good look at how it has done so. And the strange thing is it's hard to throw with the win when it's this strong as it is against it. It's just difficult to time it. 
Two minutes, 40 seconds to go in the ball game. And McEvely is back to pass. Oh, oh, look out. He throws it. It is complete. Number 37 is Brian Hayworth. Oh, he took a shot. Oh, Hendrith really leveled him. And McEvely feels it. I don't know whether it hurt as much as running into the bench or not. But. I think Hendrith has had an outstanding game. He's put pressure on McEvely practically every time that he's dropped the pass. There's something about his ability to just run right around the offensive blocker and put pressure on the quarterback. Algie Hendrith. Third down and one. Ooh, and that's a hard one to come by. Jesse Spaulding stops Dent. This is a quarterback draw, McEvely, and Spaulding reads it. Watch him fire his gun, shoot his gun, as we say, right there at the line of scrimmage with an outstanding play. Bob Pickett with a minute and a half to go, calling timeout with a fourth and one. Wants to talk to McEvely. McEvely knows he's been in a ball game today, I'll tell you that. With a break in the action at Memorial Stadium, we'll be right back after this pause. The band on the far side of the field, Florida A&M is saluting the Rattlers with a fourth and one. Massachusetts is going for it. They must make it to have a chance, and McEvely himself makes the first down. Incidentally, we'd like to thank Mike Swanson and Bill Friel for their great help in the booth here today. McEvely on the replay. It was a sprint out pass, but really he was going to run the football if there's any chance. He needed to make one yard, and he does just because he was decisive and turned up without hesitating. 121 to go, and Florida AM looks like they're going to win the national championship in Division I AA. McEvely fires who the offensive and defensive players are, but our defensive player of the game today from the University of Massachusetts, Joe McLaughlin. And to the university's general scholarship fund goes $1,000 from Chevrolet Motor Division in the name of Joe McLaughlin, who really has been outstanding in this game today. Joe McLaughlin, a senior from Stoneham, Massachusetts, playing his final game. Now, with second down and 10, McEvely running for his life, throws it, and takes a pretty good shot. Incomplete, John King on his tail. Now, the offensive player of the game, and this was really a very difficult choice, but there he is, Melvin McFadden, a junior from Daytona Beach, Florida. He and Mike Solomon were really outstanding, but McFadden's 53-yard run, which ignited the first score and brought the Rattlers back after they were down 6 to nothing, was the thing that swayed the vote. So McFadden will have his name on a $1,000 memorial as Chevrolet donates $1,000 in his name to the General Scholarship Fund of Florida A&M University. Third and 10. 109 to go. On the draw, Sorrell doesn't get very much as he drags a man with him to the 37-yard line. So time is running out. Exactly one minute to go. And we certainly could not pay enough tribute to both of these teams today. Massachusetts and Florida A&M gave us just an entire afternoon of excitement. It was three to nothing Massachusetts at the quarter, 14 to six A&M at the half, 21 to 15 in the third. With a fourth down and five, it is a first down. Chris Kurtz catching the pass from McEvely. When it scores in this position, the defensive cornerback is going to play real deep. Kurtz pushes down, breaks off. Obviously, he's open before the halfback, number 29, gets to him. 37 seconds to go. That's all that remains, and Florida A&M will take a national championship back to the campus in Tallahassee. McEvely, down the middle. He's got his man and can't hold it. Falling to the ground. Looked like Marty Paglione. And Bob Pickett, congratulations, Bob, on a fine first year as head coach at UMass. Boy, there's disappointment all over his face to bring his team this far, just within grasp of the national championship, but he has nothing to be ashamed of. His team has played outstanding football all year and in this ball game also. And now, with a second and 10 and only 32 seconds to go, McEvely 
who is six out of 18, fires a wobbly pass out of bounds, incomplete. That's all there is to go. And you get a pretty good look, I think, at Rudy Hubbard on the sidelines. What a happy guy he must be right now. There he is. His team was voted the national champion last year when there was not a playoff. It wasn't this division, as a matter of fact. He was voted national champion. Bill, I was telling him before the ball game, he was had a chance to accomplish something that probably never be accomplished again. He won the national championship the last time by vote and the first time by playoff. So with this victory today, it'll be 24 out of 25. 24 wins in the last 25 games. Paglione has a first down with 21 seconds to go. Well, the thing, of course, that puts it out of reach was that last touchdown by Solomon. It made a 13-point difference. You can see McEverly going to the tight end down the middle. The safety man, of course, is way deep. He's not going to let him get behind. And Paglione is wide open. McEverly is right on target. Another first down. Clock running. And McEverly throws it. It is incomplete. And with 10 seconds to go now, it looks like we're down to the final play of the ball game. Bill, the final stats for Solomon was 27 attempts, 208 yards. McFaith, 22 attempts, 179. Ten seconds to go. 35-22, Massachusetts trailing, trying just to get one more. And it is incomplete. Well, I guess they're going to get one more play. Well, this is Bill Fleming along with Frank Broyles and Dave Diles. Thanking you very much for being with us on this national championship playoff game today in 1AA. We've enjoyed returning to the Pioneer Bowl of Wichita Falls, Texas. And I can say, Frank and Dave, we've been treated not only royally, to, but to a great football game. A great, Bill. It's been a wonderful experience. Hopefully someday we can do it in Division One. With five seconds to go, at McEvely unloads it down the sidelines. It is caught. Touchdown. Final play of the ball game. Chris Kurtz was wrestling with the football with Louis Wilkerson, and coming down with it was Chris Kurtz. 34 yards, and it's a TD. 35 to 28. Time has run out, but Here's they're the going to give him a chance to go for two. Bill, it's an unbelievable catch by Kurtz. Wilkerson is right there. He thinks he's going to intercept it. He's waiting. He jumps up. He has it, but Kurtz comes down with the ball. So as I mentioned, even though the clock has run out, they are obligated to give them the two point, or the one point if they want to do, but they're going to go for two, the try for conversion. McEvely can't do it. He has stopped, and that will be the final score of the afternoon, and Florida A&M's Rattlers have won the national championship 35 to 28, and Rudy Hubbard is given the ride that he has hoped for the most. Now, be sure to stay tuned for ABC's Wide World of Sports at 5 o'clock Eastern and Pacific, 4 o'clock Central. Today's show featuring the Southern 500 Stock Car Race, the World High Diving Championship, the World Show Jumping Championship, and a report on Mario Andretti receiving the World Driving Championship. Once again, the final score, Florida A&M 35, Massachusetts 28. Bill Fleming, Frank Rawls, and Dave Dyer saying so long travel arrangements made through and a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United built the largest airline in the free world around you. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports. Saturday, Vinny's Christmas coat gets stolen and the suspect isn't Santa Claus.